Is that an invitation to chat before we start? No? We can chat. <laughs> we always chat before we I know, I know. Well, we got the message that we're live on YouTube. They usually remind us when we start chatting that just FYI okay. you're live. I, I, I need to remind Kevin um, before Jackie gets here that when it was your birthday, she's saying happy birthday to you. Today is her birthday. <laughs> uh, I, don't, I don't know that that's really uh, fair to the public watching. <laughs> <laughs> well you know kevin it's those other duties as assigned you know i don't want to assign those duties i'm gonna well, vote against that i no. will do it I, I just i gave everybody fair warning <laughs> it's all good There are at least three of us in blazers today. Is it? It's getting that bad, eh? There we go. Looking good. Who knows what's on? You know, on the bottom half, but <laughs> sweatpants and slippers. <laughs> I almost wore that color today. Which one? The one you're wearing. Salmon. Salmon. Yeah. Hey, happy <laughs> birthday, birthday girl. Ah, thanks. Is that decorations hanging behind your head? Yeah. <laughs> and Ken dropped by this morning with a helium balloon and a bottle of Skya. Nice. Oh. And Peggy gave me this. You'll appreciate this. Well, anybody that's over 50 will appreciate this. It's a that's fan. A fan. <laughs> now watch, watch what happens. <laughs> that's cute. I have to use it in the middle of the meeting. See, Peggy gave me a uh, wine cooler purse. Oh, I saw <laughs> that. That was super cute. All right, it's two o'clock. Let's get the meeting started. Um, everyone's here. Attendance at the beginning is 100%. Uh, calling the meeting to order for, sorry, for Tuesday, May 19, 2020. Uh, the next item on the agenda is, of course, adoption of the agenda before we go too, too far. Uh, there has been some new information just this morning from the province on playgrounds and dog parks. So uh, we have a standing agenda item uh, called emergent items. So when we get to that point, we will have a, I think Councilor Jolly is ready to make a proposed motion on um, some facility reopenings. So we're adding that to the agenda or sorry, clarifying what that is on the agenda. And I have no other additions or subtractions. Anyone else? Do we need to make the motion as amended, Mr. Flar? Even though emergent was already on there? No, the clarification is sufficient. Okay, all right. I need an adoption of the agenda. Go ahead, Councillor Mackay. That the May 19th, 2020 agenda be adopted as presented. Thank you for that. All those in favor? That is unanimous. Uh, next on our agenda is a proclamation. So I'm going to read this now. And um, I actually haven't, normally when I do proclamations, we have somebody to receive it. And I'm not sure exactly where this will end up, but I'll give it to Mr. Scoble and he can do with it as he wishes. So this is a proclamation for Frontline Worker Appreciation Day. So whereas since March 13th, 2020, the residents, businesses and staff in St. Albert have been addressing the many challenges presented by the COVID-19 pandemic. And whereas many businesses, events, activities, programs, services and amenities have been closed to the public. And whereas public health orders have prohibited mass gatherings and imposed physical distancing requirements on everyone. And whereas only essential services are being provided and whereas only essential businesses are allowed to remain open. And whereas community members rely on essential services and business providers now more than ever before. And whereas the staff working to provide essential services and businesses have experienced 
increased demand to comply with the public health orders to ensure their own safety and that of their colleagues, customers, clients, and partners. And whereas those st these staff continue to go above and beyond to ensure the people have access to the vital goods, services, and support they need during this unprecedented time in history. And whereas we are extremely grateful for the outstanding dedication, compassion, and contributions of these amazing individuals. And therefore, I, Kathy Heron, Mayor of the City of St. Albert, do hereby proclaim May 19th as Frontline Worker Appreciation Day in the City of St. Albert. So, a little bit. Thank you to uh, everyone who is going to work every day, potentially putting themselves at risk, their families, um, just to make sure that we all can have some semblance of normal life. All right, uh, presentations. All right, so we have um, a few registered speakers. Excuse me one second. Uh, some of them are to speak now at presentations and some of them are of course for the public hearing. So the ones that I have registered to speak now are, um, it's on your agenda already. We have Tony Siegel and Wendy Batog from the Twatna Valley Ski Club. And then we also have waiting in the queue, Bill Barkley, Jerry Hooser, and Sandy Clark on the Oakmont development. And um, I will get to them in a second. So Cheryl or whoever is the host of this meeting, can we please uh, let in Tony and Wendy? To, to do their presentation? You bet. Are they there? Yes, they are. Okay, I just can't see them. I can only see, do they have screens? Tony and Wendy, can you hear me? Oh, there's Wendy. Hi. Hi, and is Tony with you? Yeah. I'm here too. Okay, do you have a video? Oh, Tony? hang on. There we go. There we go. It's much, much easier so we can see each other. Absolutely. Yeah. So thanks for joining Great. us. You have been, um, I think you've been waiting for quite a while to give a presentation to St. Albert Council. And I think we're all kind of excited to hear from you. So are you guys doing this together in one five minute presentation? We are, um, I, I'll be doing uh, most of the speaking for the presentation and then Wendy's gonna come in at the end to um, finish up and answer any questions. Okay, excellent. All right, go ahead. You can start whenever you're ready. Okay, I'll just share my screen so you can see my, the PowerPoint. Okay. Uh, get it up here. Are you able to see that? Yes, we are. Okay, so I'll just put it into slideshow because you don't need to see all my notes. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, first of all, thank you very much for the opportunity to present to you today. Um, you've got myself, Tony Siegel. I'm the secretary of the Twatna Valley Ski Club and Wendy Batog is here as well. She is our president. Uh, if you're not familiar with Tawatna, uh, our ski area was a centennial project uh, that was operated and funded for 40 years by volunteers. It was then operated by Westlock County through a contract with a private manager and is now back being operated through a contract with our nonprofit group, the Tawatna Valley Ski Club. And we are located 50 minutes north of St. Albert, uh, just a little bit east of Highway 2. So the, the goal of our presentation today really is to get feedback from all of you as to how we can better serve St. Albert's residents' social and recreational needs. And also to find out who we can better engage with in your community, um, to, just to um, make those connections and, and find out how to connect with your residents. So um, the PowerPoint that we circulated has a lot of information, way too much to go over in five minutes. So we'll just be touching on some slides briefly in order to stay within the timelines. 
So on this first slide, you can just see that um, it's a little bit of information on our visits and we're definitely heading in the right direction with our numbers going up. This uh, is comparing the season before last to this past year. And you'll see that our day student visits um, did go down. Um, we believe that's due to COVID-19 as we did have to close two weeks early and we missed out on some school visits and a couple big weeks. Uh, for programming, we offer learn to ski programs for schools, group and private lessons. We have a snow squad kids club and we have a freestyle ski club and Nordic club that use us as a home base. We also have a happy hour pub night on Saturday evenings. And we're working with some local community groups towards having an adaptive skiing and snowboarding program available. We have a number of special events through the season. Many of them are in partnership with other clubs and organizations. Facility wise, we offer skiing, snowboarding, cross country skiing, tubing, snowshoeing and skating. We have a rental shop with skis, snowboards and snowshoes. We have a licensed cafe with healthy options. And uh, we had do wedding and special event rentals. Now this is where we need your help. Um, over the past two seasons, we've seen an increase in the percentage of visitors from, the, from Edmonton, but our percentage from St. Albert remains pretty constant at 3%. So how do we best reach and attract the citizens of St. Albert? Um, here financially, like most recreational facilities, we rely on municipal grants as part of our budget. We also have a team that actively seats out grants and donations. Volunteers are a big part of our success. They help us create a sense of community and connection as well. They help us with our bottom line. And our board is actively planning for the future uh, via the methods listed in the next four slides. We're working with Nate on some um, projects with their students. We've done a PRISM study to find out what type of people like to come visit our um, facilities. We've done community engagement. And we've also developed a strategic plan. So Wendy. I'd also like to add to that, Tony, uh, we've joined the St. Albert Chamber of Commerce for the last two years, as well as presented to the St. Albert Rotary Center or Club, and as well uh, done the digital board advertising in St. Albert for the last two years. Uh, at this point, we'd like to hear from you how we best can serve your residents, who are key partners we should work with, how can we get the word out about uh, what we can offer? And as well in closing, we take pride in giving all the most authentic connection possible in Twatna Valley, as you can see with all our work. And uh, thank you very much for having us. Are there any questions today? Well, thank you um, for coming and, and actually kind of making this a little bit more public. I saw Councillor Jolly's hand pop up right away to, with questions, so I'm going to let her start it off. Thank you. Um, and thank you for the presentation. Uh, I actually, seeing this on the agenda, I had, I, I didn't know why you're presenting, so it, it's glad to see that. Um, this, I don't think this is really a, a great format for kind of the back and forth that you're looking for, but what I would recommend is I'll, I'll send you my details um, if you wanted to meet. I'm both a cross-country skier and a downhill skier, um, as are the rest of the members of my family, so I have quite a bit of involvement with kind of youth and um, recreational um, skiing in, in the community and, and really in Alberta. So, um, and I, I suspect there are other people on council who would be willing to meet kind of in a smaller meeting setting um, to maybe give, give some ideas of who to contact um, to, to get the word out that this exists. Cause I, I, I didn't know this exists. I, I go ski down in Kananaskis cause I, I didn't know this was here. So um, yeah. I'll well, send you my, my details and it would be great to meet if, if you're interested. Absolutely. Yes, please. That, uh, as, as you know, our, our ski hill is different from many in Edmonton. We, we offer both cross country and downhill at the same facility. So we'd be happy to have any engagement from, from your community. Yeah, thank you. 
All right, uh, Councillor Hansen, go ahead. Uh, thanks. Uh, great presentation. And um, I have to admit, I also did not know very much about what uh, you provided. So I guess I wanted to just jump back into the school programs. Are any of St. Albert schools actually using your facilities uh, for programs? Uh, not currently. We do have some church um, programs that come use our program um at the hill usually saturday or sunday but schools uh, we did canvas the schools um our first year and uh they were more inclined to go to snow valley um it's a closer um i guess facility uh, with a magic carpet at this moment we're working on grants right now to install a magic carpet for our learn to ski programs okay um uh, yeah, I guess, you know, from my perspective, I'm happy to get your social media information and, and, um, and share whatever and follow you and share whatever you can do uh, so that we can start to, to bring the awareness. Um, because, you know, holding it 3% isn't great for you. And it's probably not great for us when it sounds like we've got this gem. Right, right around the corner well, and we're not we're not utilizing it uh to the yeah. best that we can i i think um what i evaluate is um our drive is the same as as city rush hour traffic to snow valley and and i guess what maybe some schools don't realize about twatna valley you can rent the whole hill to yourself the whole nice. the school, that school is only on the hill for you um if you have a, a large number and we did host mornville schools this year and which were successful. Um, we do have a rope toe currently, but like I say, we're, we have a Canadian Adaptives Disability Program we're working with on grants uh, for installing a magic carpet at, at, in our next uh, framework of years, so. That's great. Well, I uh, really appreciate learning more about you and just, you know, from my perspective, we, we do try and do a lot of regional collaboration and regional awareness and and this is one of those things that's that for yeah. for us is a regional asset so thank yes. you for sharing your story okay and thank you for connecting with us uh, i'll be sure to give you our our information yeah any other questions from other members of council i'm seeing none and i just am curious have you been working with our recreation staff at all uh we we have not no um, there, there was in our first year, a lady that came out to our chalet cross country skiing, and she was with the recreational department of St. Albert and, um, whether she was, uh, just a member of the family or knew of someone, I, I never did hear back from, from that, from that lead, I guess. So it would, it would be worth sending an email to our director of recreation to, for her thoughts as well. Okay. Yep. And you know, like everyone else said, we can help promote through social media, et cetera. I uh, used to be a skier, but I hurt my knee, so now I'm just a, a tuber. <laughs> okay, well, we have that there too, so. And, and I used to go skiing at Tawanda like many years ago, so. Yeah, okay, well, yeah. I don't ski at all, so I just uh, <laughs> enjoy the family ambiance and the crumb, all the uh, people out there. It's a very social place, yeah. so. Continue to come and network at the Chamber of Commerce too. I think that would be good. Yes, we can continue that. Yes, thank you. All right. Thank you All so right. much for joining thank us. You. All Excellent. right. Excellent. Thank you. Thanks for hearing from us. Bye now. Bye. Okay, Cheryl, um, can we let in the three members of the public that would like to speak to item 8.1? Uh, people out there that it's a very social place so continue to come and network at the chamber of commerce too i think that would be good yes oh, Cheryl, are we led, I see Sandy Clark there now. I see Bill. 
Let's see Sandy's name, but not her face. And Jerry. Sandy, Bill. Well, Bill, you're already live, I can see. Sandy and Jerry, can you turn your cameras? Thank you. There we go. That's much better. Now we can see you. So thank you for joining us. Um, I've been told that you want to speak to um, an item that's coming up to, about first reading and setting of a public hearing date, and that you've been kind of told by our alleged staff that uh, we will not be taking any specific comments on the proposed amendments themselves, that you're just going to be speaking on uh, the legislative and the process of, of first reading and setting the public hearing date. Is, is that understood by everyone? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Right, because I, I think, I think especially Bill is aware that um, it's, it's our obligation and, and very much set out in Alberta law that we have to give a developer the opportunity um, to come before council and that has to be done within a reasonable time. And so I, I'm assuming you all understand that. I'm, I'm gonna absolutely encourage you to take your five minutes. I, I will have um, to, to cut you off though, if you start talking about the actual proposal, whether it be the appropriateness of it or, it's, or your opinions or any of the studies that are in the package, that all will need to come in a public setting uh, on right now, I think the date is June 22nd. So, Everyone understands that? Yes. Thank you. It'll make everything go much easier. So uh, I, I'll go in the, in the order that I think the registrations occurred. And I think Bill, you were first, then Jerry, and then Sandy. Does that work? Sure. All right. So go ahead, Bill. You take your five minutes. All right, uh, Mayor ha um, Heron Council, thanks very much for hearing from us today. I, I understand it's procedural in nature and I, I just have one real point that I want to make before you. Um, can, every, can you hear me uh, properly? Yes, Absolutely. thanks. Yeah. Good, all right. Um, on February 4th uh, of this year, I made a FOIP application uh, to the city uh, related to these bylaws. It's been three and a half months uh, since then, and I still have not received any documents. Uh, my submission to you today is that uh, proceedings related to these by bylaws should be postponed until the requested records are raised or, or received. Sorry, uh, I will uh, say and acknowledge, of course, that. Uh, We've all been dealing with fallout from COVID, and I have uh, no uh, uh, doubt that uh, city staffing issues and priorities have changed uh, because of that. Um, uh, I'm also aware that the uh, pro provincial government has uh, extended uh, deadlines for FOIP responses. Uh, in addition, I know that a certain amount of the delay was caused by my negotiations with staff to determine uh, the scope of my request. Uh, basically, the city's initial estimate of costs uh, for my request was almost $1,200, which I thought was too expensive. Uh, I therefore worked with staff to limit the nature of the request and the costs. Uh, staff were helpful in working through that process with me. But at the end of the day, it's still been three and a half months and I, uh, I, I don't have uh, any documents as of yet. And basically the public should not be prejudiced by having to go into a public hearing without all the available information. Uh, I did submit two documents to you today. Uh, I don't know how we're going to deal with those in terms of sharing, but uh, um, ha have those been provided to you? Okay, yeah. thanks. Yeah, so I, I'd like to refer to them uh, now. Uh, both uh, were provided to me by uh, city staff um, and uh, both make it quite clear that all of the requested documents have been searched for and located long ago prior to March 2nd, 2020 when I received the first document, which is uh, titled Timesheet and Fee Calculation Worksheet. If you uh, look at that document, I'm not going to go through all of these documents, but uh, a particular relevance on the last page of that document, you'll see uh, under the heading 
record summary, uh, there are there is a, a number of documents and types of documents expressly provided for. So the city has known what it has um, this uh, all this time. The second document uh, is an email from city staff uh, about the requested documents. And on the second page of that document, you'll see a heading uh, or a bullet, studies and reports. Throughout the document, you'll see there's numerous documents which are relevant to this uh, these proceedings. Um, but the reports are, are of particular relevance that are referred to here, and they still haven't been disclosed. So uh, some of those are dated February 2020, which is uh, after the developer's last uh, open house or, or meeting. Um, and, uh, and, and certainly appear clearly relevant. So the bottom line is that the city's had a lot of records related to, to this development, uh, which are clearly relevant, but have not been produced. Uh, this is not a case where the records could not be located. They've been a known factor for months now. Now, uh, as a point of information, uh, I did receive correspondence from the city this past Thursday indicating that they hope to be able to provide me uh, with uh, most of the information by the end of this week and the rest of the information on or about June 5th. Uh, subs, uh, that is subject, however, to uh, uh, potential third party appeals, which Mr. LaFleur adv advised me were possible uh, yet. So it's possible that there's going to be appeals of this and we still don't have the documents. And I'm obviously concerned about the possibility of having to go into a public hearing uh, without those documents. So I'm asking you to postpone uh, uh, proceedings related to the bylaw and uh, those are my um, uh, submissions. Thank you. And hopefully that was that. Hopefully that was a birthday hug for. That's the second Hansen. morning, and I think you came in right at five minutes. So thank you for that. Uh, you know, I'm going to get you to stay. Well, first of all, any questions for Mr. Barkley from members of council? Okay. Um, I'm going to. Oh, go ahead, Councillor Hughes. Thank you. Do you? I was the quick question I had for you was: citizen negotiations concluded, and you had agreed on a price. How long has it been since then to now? Um, I, uh, uh, March 20th, I uh, provided a, a reduced scope to uh, city staff and uh, paid my deposit on the same date. Um, uh, an estimate for the reduced scope has not been given to me as of yet. Do you have any idea of, did they get back to you about when you think the records will be re given to you? Well, as I said, uh, Mr. Lafar has told me that he uh, hopes to have uh, most of the records for me by the end of this week. And uh, the remaining records, I understand. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I take it Councillor Hughes can still hear me. Uh, the remaining uh, records, I understand, have to wait until at least June 5th, at which time they would be released if no appeals are filed by third parties related to those documents. Okay, I'm gonna talk real fast because I have the dogs. Um, so if you were to receive them later on this week, do you feel you'd have enough time though? I mean, you'd still have three to four weeks to review them before the public hearing. So I know if you're I, asking for delay, but you would still have quite a bit of time to review them prior to. I would, I would still, if I got everything this week, uh, I still likely would have time. Uh, of course, I don't know. I'm, I'm guessing at this stage. I don't know if uh, all the documents are being provided, what the, the scope is, uh, things of that nature. So there's some issues potentially outstanding. But yes, if, uh, if I had them today, uh, I couldn't argue about it. Is two, two days going to make a difference uh, um, in the scope of things? Likely not. Okay, so if we talk to administration, they confirm that they are expecting to release them in the next few days, then the date of the public hearing would still be okay with you? And we wouldn't uh, need to do anything in? No, it wouldn't because uh, uh, they've told me that I'm not going to get all of the documents 
uh, and uh, there's still a potential appeal by a third party uh, uh, that could be filed uh, nice. up until June 5th. Okay, so then you could potentially receive it as of June 5th? Potentially. And so assuming that you did receive it on June 5th, would that, wouldn't that be enough time again since you still have two weeks? I would have two weeks. I don't know what the documents uh, are or the implications of them. Potentially, yeah. of course, there's a possibility of uh, retaining an expert, uh, but I don't. I don't know. I, I have to speculate about documents at this stage because I just don't know what they are. Okay. Well, I'll just ask Min about their timeline, and we'll see how that goes. Thank you. Thank. Thank you. Any other questions? Go ahead, Councillor Watkins. Yeah, there's there's a lot of information available uh, about the project already, about the densities and zonings, heights, all sorts of things. What are you hoping to gather from all these other documents that you have asked for? Well, we've been concerned uh, all along, Councillor Watkins, that uh, uh, no offense, but uh, the developer talks to administration all the time, and we don't know what goes on between administration and the city, uh, and felt that there were uh, the possibility of documents there that uh, we're not aware of. Uh, clearly, uh, you know, if you, you know, I used the example uh, in the March 13th email where you've got. Um, uh, apparently uh, a market report which we've been calling for for eons and hasn't I, I've never seen one um, and then we've got slope stability addendum apparently that's an addendum to their report which they haven't produced to us and I haven't seen it in the city's recent disclosure uh, there's more addendums listed here um, uh, and you know quite frankly uh, we public deserves to be able to look at these documents. Okay, so it's, so it's basically your submission that you've been with, information's been withheld that's been germane to the issue that you haven't been receiving. Well, information, city clearly has some, some information. I assume some of that has come from third parties, but uh, uh, we haven't gotten it, no. Yeah, sometimes reports, sometimes reports have some sensitivity and some confidentiality related to them and they may have to be held until uh, future times or they may be submitted in draft forms and they maybe uh, don't want to submit a draft because they're amending it so I'm not too sure about all the details I guess they'll all come out when the public hearing comes and all the information that's online I guess I I hope so I would I would I would hope that nothing's being withheld from you that's germane to the subject or has been withheld those are my questions that's my questions madam mayor thank you thank you any other questions all right, um, Mr. Barkley, I'm going to ask you to just stay there because you, you might want to hear the other two presenters and then I'm going to make some comments at the end. So next I had, I think Jerry, you're up next. Councillors, there we go. Uh, my name is Jerry Huzar. I have been a resident of St. Albert for over 26 years and I live in Oakmont. First, I wish to speak about the proposed time of the public hearing. I understand that administration is recommending that the public hearing be scheduled for June 22nd, commencing at 9 o'clock a.m. I have some concerns with that 9 o'clock a.m. start time on a weekday. Uh, the circumstances with COVID-19 have made things difficult for a lot of people. Those that are fortunate to be working during these times may not be able to get away from work during the day so they can speak before council. Others may have small children to take care of during the day. Will such an early and unusual start time reduce public participation? I mean, who knows for sure, but if the city's reason for the earlier time is in anticipation of more people speaking or watching, it may have the opposite effect if less people are able to attend. As an option, Council could stay within its standard 5 o'clock p.m. time for the public hearing, even if the hearing needs to be scheduled for consecutive Mondays or a Monday, Tuesday. Alternatively, if Council wants to conduct this hearing in one day, then Council might be able to schedule a hearing for a Saturday starting at, say, 2 o'clock p.m. The ultimate goal is to enable as much public participation as possible. Next, 
I trust that you have a copy of the four page attachment that I sent to the city. The attachment includes a copy of my April 30th email to Mr. Kevin Scoble with a CC to council, in which a postponement of this first reading and of the public hearing date was requested. I believe the reasons for the postponement therein speak for themselves. The request was made on behalf of a group of St. Albert residents that go by the name Oakmont Boudreaux Development Concern Residents. Over 60 families from different neighborhoods in St. Albert belong to the group, although as you might expect, most of us live in Oakmont or Erin Ridge. Because of the current social meeting restrictions, our group typically communicates through email. However, there are many more people who follow our Facebook page and we are active in several St. Albert community chat rooms. We strongly believe that citizens should be able to participate at a public hearing in person rather than by electronic or virtual means. To listen or watch a hearing on a computer using Zoom is not the same as being there. For council, seeing several faces in the gallery is much more impactful than seeing or hearing one person at a time in Zoom. As well, there may be people who are, are opposed to an issue, but they may not be able to understand how the technology works so they could voice their concerns. We support the COVID-19 related restrictions, but they have adversely limited our group's ability to meet collectively in a constructive manner and to discuss issues. In fact, a meeting our group had scheduled in March at Service Place with over 50 confirmed attendees had to be canceled. In conclusion, we believe that it's for the public's benefit when the hearing is held in person and it is the citizens who lose the most when it's not. Therefore, as stated in the attachment, we request that the council defer the public hearing date until at least September when the chances of an in-person public hearing are more likely possible. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any questions? Go ahead, Councillor Hansen. Uh, thank you. Um, I guess I would just um, appreciate the concern as it relates to public engagement and uh, the timing, etc. Uh, um, but I guess, Mr. Who's our, what happens if restrictions aren't lifted? Um, so what happens if restrictions are not lifted and September is not going to be an okay? What happens if we have a second surge? Um, you know the development uh, the the developers uh, we did you know we have an obligation to let the process um, take place we don't have a lot of control over this virus uh, we are trying to um, maintain some normalcy as as it relates to uh, business certainly business that that might be bringing stimulus as well so i guess i, I throw that back at you what happens if we're in a second surge? How far do you want this to be postponed? Well, uh, that's a good question. Um, uh, obviously, it can't be indefinite. Uh, we are hoping that uh, uh, the restrictions will be eased. Uh, there is, uh, uh, you know, some restrictions are starting to be lifted now. We're hopeful that those type of things occur within the next few weeks. And if they are, then we could uh, meet our uh, objective of having the public hearings in person. Uh, we don't expect that it could go on for indefinite. We're aware that there could be a second surge. And if that happens, then we can deal with it at that time. Uh, thank you for that. And I guess I would just follow up with, uh, you know, as far as gatherings go, we are going to be restricted to lower numbers, no matter what, uh, probably for the, the foreseeable future. So I think uh, I appreciate that we need to take all of these things into consideration. Um, and I appreciate that, uh, that a public hearing in person is obviously the most ideal situation that we could possibly hope for. Um, and so I appreciate that that's um, your take on it and we'll just have to weigh all the benefits. Thank you. 
Thank you, Councillor. Any more questions? Okay, seeing none, uh, I'm gonna move over to Sandy for her presentation. Good afternoon, Mayor Heron, councillors. Thank you for letting, allowing me to speak today. I am simply going to reiterate um, what Jerry has said in the fact that a public hearing needs to be accessible to the majority, not the minority. And I think that on a Monday morning at 9 a.m., uh, that probably precludes a fair number of people from attending. Um, and I would ask that it either be at the 5, 5 p.m. start or um, a more appropriate time, especially given that we're in phase one and people are now returning from a long layoff where there's been no financial support for them other than what the government is giving them. And um, they obviously don't wanna give up a day's paycheck or a half day's paycheck to be able to come to a public hearing. Uh, the other request that I would make is that, um, and it may already have taken place, um, but that IT assistance be given to those citizens that want to set up Zoom and be part of, um, be part of the hearing. Um, there's a lot of residents in the Oakmont and Erin Ridge area who may be more senior than those that are getting more familiar with Zoom as we move forward. I know for myself, um, I logged into the meeting at about five to two today um, and had to send a message to, to uh, David LaFleur uh, because I wasn't into the meeting um, until this opened up and I was told that I would have to go to YouTube to be able to see the meeting until I was invited in to this particular portion. That precludes people from being able to see what other citizens are um, actually in the meeting. So I'm not sure if that's something that could be um, rectified before the next public hearing. But I think that's something that should maybe be open to any public hearing, not just the Oakmont public hearing. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Go ahead, Councillor Hansen. Mayor, are we uh, asking questions of administration at this point? Okay. All right, seeing none, I, I just want to um, say a few words to the three of you and whoever else may be watching. So I started off with a little bit of a commentary about our requirements to be fair to all, all parties involved with this and that includes the proponent. Um, and so, you know, Alberta law has given them the right to that hearing and it's really difficult to delay a public hearing beyond the time required essentially to comply with this with the advertising requirements saying that though um we are in a we are in a different situation for a couple of reasons one of them is because of the FOIP request and uh, I've, I've been told by our staff and i think mr lafar told you mr barkley that by the end of the week you'll have the majority of it I'm gonna ask him when we do questions to administration um, a little bit about this appeal and that he and we can maybe get some clarity there. But, um, you know, there has been the electronics and how we run um, a public hearing is, is going to be unique. But at the same time, um, the Minister of Municipal Affairs, or so the Government of Alberta, in, in issued a ministerial order, and that's 50 2020, to remove all doubt that virtual meetings and public hearings are legally valid to be done electronically. I believe we, we could just take email submissions, and that would actually meet our legislative requirements for public hearing. St. Albert doesn't want to do that. We want to make this as, as as public as we possibly can. So we're gonna do it over the Zoom platform. And saying that, I don't know what the, what the times will look like on June 22nd, which is the proposed date. There, there might be a, you know, a slight increase uh, or an opening of City Hall. I've talked to um, mayors across Alberta, Grand Prairie is offering IT support um, in the lobby of their City Hall. So if somebody doesn't know how to do it, there's an IT person there with a computer who will help them, or maybe we'll allow a few people into chambers. We'll do everything we can to make sure this is a publicly accessible meeting. Um, as for the start time, you know, my, my time on council, I've seen more attendance during the day than in the evening ever. We find that 
people get busy in the evening and, and there's it's hard to pick a right time for this. And we're hoping that the Zoom platform will actually allow people to participate more so than, than actually taking time off work and coming down to City Hall and attending and sitting there for hours. But there are some really awkward um, and difficult procedural things if we have to adjourn a public hearing. So we're trying to accomplish this all in one day. And uh, I, I personally think that we will have a lot of speakers and I don't, if we go, if we start at five, we might not be done till well after midnight and that might not make for good decision making at that time. So saying all that, um, I we have opened this up as much as we can to the public, but we, is, we have also um, delayed the public hearing. It was supposed to be, the recommendation was for it to be June 15th, I think, and we have actually pushed that off. So you will have more time to review the data. As Councillor Watkins said, there is a lot of it already available that's public. So I think there'll probably be some duplication in the, in your FOIP release. And I'm gonna probably get a little bit more clarification from Mr. LaFleur when we ask him questions, um, but then we will, we will go to a vote and we'll be setting the date um, momentarily. So thank you all for joining us. Um, I, I believe you, you were given instructions on how to watch the end of it through YouTube so you can hear what we ask uh, Mr. LaFleur because I have a feeling there might be a few questions. I have one myself. Um, does that work for you guys? You can watch the rest of the meeting that way. Okay, I'm seeing some nods. Excellent. All right. So the rest of the presentations that are registered are for the public hearing council. So we will wait till we get to them uh, later on today. Uh, it's actually not even on the agenda, questions of administrations, <laughs> but we obviously al always do that. So I'm going to, I'm going to ask uh, whoever's the host for the meeting to bring it back to just council. And uh, I'm seeing hands pop up, but I'll just start off. Mr. LaFleur, Mr. Barkley talked about an appeal. So who can appeal the FOIP release and what does that look like? Okay, um, sometimes when a request for records is made, it will turn out that uh, some of the records involve the rights of third parties, particularly, let's say an expert has, has put in a report saying, well, you know, this is, this is confidential only for the recipient. Typically, that's not a good reason to not disclose it, but uh, our practice, and again, as, as per uh, a section of FOIP is to go to those people and ask, do you have a problem? And we did that. And I made a decision. I have decided that every single thing is going to be disclosed, every report from every expert. And uh, there was, in this case, there was only one of them that we had to actually ask them. That was a, a servicing report dealing with things like water, sewer, storm sewer. Uh, and I say that because the topic of that report isn't directly relevant to what's before council. It would certainly be very relevant to the planning department on a development permit application but it would be marginally relevant at the level of deciding, is this the kind of development you want to see there? So in any event, uh, the uh, I've made a decision and the FOIPAC says that when I make that decision that I'm going to release a document, that person has one last chance to appeal. They have uh, two weeks to appeal to the privacy commissioner. And if they don't appeal, I will release the document. So just to, so it's clear, there's one document only, one 42 page report that might have to wait until uh, June 5th. And, and indeed, if, if in fact that person decides to appeal to the privacy commissioner, it might have to wait longer than that. But that's the only one and that's what the appeal is all about. Just it's an appeal of my decision to release the, the document to in this case, the uh, Mr. Barkley who made the request. So everything is going out this week, except for that one document? Yes, is every, everything is about ready to go. Uh, we, when I say ready to go, Mr. Barkley made the point, and he's correct, that the city has had a, if not 100%, pretty close to 100% idea of what relevant documents there are for some time. Uh, and he's also correct that, you know, uh, the coming of COVID and the redeploying of staff kind of delayed things a little bit, but also, very importantly, just because you have documents and know what they are, that's when the real work starts. You have to go through each each document one by one 
and evaluate each one against the criteria in the FOIP Act. Should it be released? If it should be released, are there redactions to it? Or is it personal information? That takes a lot of time. And that's what has taken the time, but I'm very happy to say that the amount of documents, the volume of documents uh, to go out uh, is, is actually, it's funny, I'm sitting here at my desk looking at, at the two things. Today's council packet is actually larger than the number of documents that we have to go out. So it's not like it's a huge volume. It's not, it's not boxes and boxes. It's, it's, a, it's a significant amount, but it's not a huge amount for someone who's used to reading a lot of material. And I am confident that it will be ready to go even before this Friday. I, I, we're, we're pretty much ready to go in the next couple of days. Okay. All right, I have a question. I saw Natalie, uh, who else had their hand up? Councillor Hughes, Councillor Broadhead, Councillor Hansen. Okay, go ahead, Councillor Jolly. Thank you. Um, I guess this would be to Mr. Scoble. Um, so Sandy kind of brought up a good point about kind of this technology use and a bit of a learning curve. Uh, are we able to reach out to the library and, you know, St. Albert seniors to see if anyone is offering, you know, how to Zoom classes? You know, I know I taught my in-laws how to do it and it took me to five five minutes, but I'm, I'm wondering if anyone out there is, is offering that kind of service. Uh, I'm not aware of the library's offering, but, you know, certainly we, we can uh, provide the information well in advance of the public hearing and I'll talk to our IT department. Maybe we could do a mock one so that everybody can try and connect. And if there's problems, we can work with them to make sure they have connectivity. Awesome. Okay, great, thank you. That's all I have. All right, Councillor Hughes. Thank you. I had pulled this off consent, but I think I might just put it back on if we get all the questions answered now. Um, so one of the things is um, the Premier said saying that potentially June 19th, we could be going into phase two. If we go into phase two, does that change the direction of how we do our council meetings, like physically or not? Well, it could perhaps, but if the announcement is on the day of the public hearing, we won't be in a position to react that quickly. So no, but it's the nineteenth. Like he'll announce it. I'm yeah. assuming prior to yeah. the nineteenth, we're going to yeah. effect the nineteenth. This is the twenty-second. So I'm not sure if it would change how we do business or not. I'm just looking just to. It's yeah, do. so we'll have to see what we can do, and and uh, but I mean we've got a complete facility reopening plan that says so we won't be open for business at eight o'clock on Monday morning, all normal. It's going to be very different, and it's probably going to take us a while. Um, so we're absolutely. thinking that regardless of what the announcement is, we'd probably be doing this online. Like this is for planning purposes because I'm thinking to tell people it's online. And then they're like, okay, I can still go to work and I can just call in when it's my turn. And then we say, now it's gonna be in person. It could change their ability to actually show up for their planning. So I'm, what I'm trying to figure out is, would this change it or are we expecting it to be virtual? Well, I would, I would assume at this point plan for virtual because I mean, it's a moving target, the date it's tentative right now. It could move up, it could move down. It, you know, again, we, yeah. there's nothing cast in stone about that particular date at this point. Right. I think okay. we could probably even do a hybrid if if at all possible right yeah that way we could just accommodate people if they couldn't do it that'd be great but i guess i would like to qualify if we if it is around that date we may not be fully open or open at all on the monday morning um, right you know, if, if council wishes you can you can always uh ask a whole pile of staff to work overtime to get ready through the weekend too so, yeah. no it's not that i'm just trying to figure out what we should expect so that people are surprised our, if it's our like facility reopening plan is in weeks it's not in hours let's put it that way <laughs> Okay, so then we should plan for that. The other question I had is, Councillor Hughes, hold on. Mr. Far, you put your hand up just to, did you want to jump in on that as well? Uh, no, Mayor, it, the CAO just answered exactly what okay. I was going to put in. Sorry about that. Okay, go ahead, Councillor Hughes. Thank you. The other question is, let's say some people um, are not only not computer savvy, but don't have computers, you know, like, so do we have accommodations where they can just call in or if they have handouts again, but so for some people, email is overwhelming. I know them. So um, how do we plan to accommodate people who either, like, you know, because before they could just hand in handouts and we can we would take them on the spot type of thing. Or if they just can't handle the computer and Zoom, can they call in? Or do we have other options for people who just are not going to be able to master either having a laptop and calling in through Zoom? Okay. 
Uh, I, I thought David would answer this. It's my understanding you can participate by telephone as well, but I'll, I'll let David provide further information. Well, I, I, just, uh, I think the best way to answer that is to say that uh, we know that there are not just this, but a couple of public hearings coming up that might be uh, might attract a lot of you know uh, participation or desire to participate. We're looking at different options to do that, and I can I can assure all members of council that our, our totally guiding thread in all of this is how can we get the greatest number of people who want to participate able to do that. Obviously, I mean you you can't reach everyone. If a person, for example, is illiterate, you can't very well get them to write something. But right. most people are able to write. We should be able to get people uh, instructions if they if they have a computer, even rudimentary skills. We should be able to walk them through that. We'll do everything we can to encourage as much participation as we possibly can. I can assure you of that. I can't give you details now because we're still looking at different options, and some of it involves, uh, as I'm learning, a lot more work on the IT side, as you might think. But that's what they're there for, and they're excellent. So we we will get that done as best we can. Okay, I think I know I pulled eight one off consent, but I think I'm getting most of my questions answered now, so we can put it back on for web services. That's it. Thank you. Uh, next, I had uh, Councilor Broadhead. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I, uh, through you, I guess to Mr. Lafleur, just understanding that the government has has, has established that uh, virtual meetings uh, are, are legal. Is that, I, given that anything can be tested in court, uh, should uh, uh, a request go to the courts to have that reviewed in light of a public hearing like we're anticipating on June 22nd? Um, what's the implication of that? Is that a, like, if they were to do that, would it be a one week delay or in, in, in light of that, What's our uh, obligation to the developer or proponent? I guess that's the word. Okay, so there's a couple of things. Like if, I, if I may take a moment to unpack the question, there's a couple of things in there. So first of all, the the um, the ministerial order that, that that legitimizes all virtual council meetings and public hearings. I think the chances of a successful challenge to that would be almost nil. Uh, it's it, the government has the right to issue uh, edicts of that sort as long as they do it procedurally in the correct way, which they have. So I, I wouldn't worry about that. What the other thing that may be in, implied in your question is that we are breaching our duty of fairness by setting a public hearing um, either on the date that it's being proposed or in the format, i.e. all virtual or, or both. Uh, I, I think the the chances of a challenge on that basis are also very small. One, one can never say nothing. If you ever hear a lawyer saying, I guarantee, uh, <laughs> ignore, anything, ignore anything he says after that, because you know, you're, you're, subject, you're subject to judges who are human beings, right? And, and they're imperfect human beings and they may make poor decisions and, and uh, there you go. But what we've attempted to do, just to sort of draw the, draw the threads together, what we've attempted to do is come up with something that does respect all of our obligations. And you're quite correct, Councillor. Uh, there is an obligation to, a, 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 you've used the word developer, many people have. I would prefer to say the owner of land. A person who is an owner or occupier of land has a right to have a council consider their proposal for rezoning or changing the area structure plan that affects their land. They do not have a right to any particular decision from you. You could disagree, you could vote it down, but they have a right to a hearing. And they have a right to a hearing within a reasonable time. And what is reasonable depends on all the circumstances. So what we've attempted to do here is propose a time that allows everyone a chance to look at all the relevant material, you know, bearing in mind that what is before council uh, now on, on, on these bylaws is simply um, the zoning and the area structure plan. It is not the detailed work that would go into a development um, application, right? Uh, if, if, if council decides this is the kind of development that is suitable for this, then the developer would have the option, not the obligation, but the option to make an application for a development permit. And then a lot of this detailed information becomes very relevant there or on an appeal to the SDAB. 
but what's before council now is simply at the very conceptual level, is this the kind of development we want in that particular part of St. Albert? And um, it, it's, that, it's that that a, that a developer has the right to a decision on. The developer has the right to know, should I spend any more time or money pursuing this or is council just gonna say, you know, we just don't think this is the right thing for that place. They need to know that in a reasonable time. And also those who, uh, who have concerns need to have a reasonable amount of time to look at the material and, and marshal their arguments. What we brought before you today is our best shot at a, at a reasonable balancing of those, of those sometimes competing interests. Fair enough, thank you very much, appreciate that. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. And this question would be probably through you to Mr. LaFleur. Um, is it reasonable to think that by June 22nd, even if we were able to open up our building um, for a public hearing, that we would not be able to have a full gallery, that there would have to be uh, physical distancing between, and there would have to be a certain amount of overflow in the Douglas Cardinal room, which would essentially be uh, by remote, uh, by video, um, which kind of defeats the purpose. I guess what I'm asking you is that even if we were open as a building, we would have to limit our uh, participants in. So that's my first question. Well, it, it's obviously not possible to know what the government of Alberta is going to do in terms of gradual relaxing and how, how far they'll go, if they might pull back, if, if something happens in terms of uh, new cases of COVID. It's hardly possible, but I can say this. If the existing orders and guidelines stay in place uh, as of June 22nd, it's, it's almost inconceivable to me how we could do a normal public hearing with a, a gallery that as you know, a normal amount of people, you'd have to have separation, you'd have to have a uh, limit on the, no the total number of people that are there. It would be difficult to do. You could potentially do some sort of hybrid, but it would be, it would be difficult, yes. Uh, and then you are at, a, at the mercy of picking and choosing who can come in and who cannot come in. So I, I think that's difficult. Um, but I guess my second question would be from a timing perspective, um, is it possible to split the day, like start at nine, go till noon, start at two, um, go till whenever uh, to accommodate work schedules? Although I think I do agree with Mayor that um, having a virtual meeting is, is easier to get to than actually physically coming down. But what is the, is there a problem with a process like that? If it ended up being a lot of people that were part of suggesting that we like nine till noon and then we um and rico start recess. again at three yeah so that we are accommodating um those who find mornings difficult uh, because you know thing is we have to set a time and it's not going to be perfect for anybody for everybody uh, that's th that's the way it goes so um, if I may, the, the, these sorts of fine tunings are possible and you could, you could uh, craft a motion that, that does that. The key thing though, is that it's really not a good idea to have any significant gap between you know, the first part of a public hearing and the second to go into another day or, or much worse, another week. And the reason for that is because council members are not supposed to talk about this during an adjournment. But for a matter like this, that's gathered this much public attention, well, you're all council members. I mean, can you imagine the, the pressure you'd be under to talk to people, you know, to talk about the substance when the public hearing is in recess? Uh, we don't want to put you in that position. So we, we do strongly recommend that we set a public hearing for a time that you have the best possible chance of getting through it all in one day, or at the very worst, maybe the following day, but the, even that is not ideal. So. Anyway, that's that's the that's the. Concern. I appreciate that it was it was th more the logistics of it all, and I, I uh, tend to agree with you uh, one time, and as long as it takes. Thank you. Any more questions, of staff? Oh, Councillor Mackay, you did. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I'll be quick because I uh, most of my questions have been answered already, and I appreciate that. But just for clarity, Mr. Lafleur, um, after first reading 
What are our requirements under the MGA to hold a, a public hearing? Is there a specific time in the MGA or is it as soon as practical? No, that's a good question. I appreciate that. So um, there, you have to leave a certain amount of time. And I, I have to point out that not every city does it the way do, we do. The city of Edmonton actually, well, not all the time, but sometimes they'll set the public hearing to come first before even first reading. They'll have the public hearing. And then after the public hearing, they will go to first reading, second reading. And if there's unanimous consent, third reading all in one meeting. But we have a longstanding tradition in, in, um, in this city of having, the public, having first reading on one date and then setting a public hearing. And there's where the MGA requires you to, uh, to observe certain advertising requirements that include certain timelines for advertising. And so what it, it usually works out that there has to be at least three weeks between meetings. In most cases, depending on when your meetings occur, it has to be four weeks. So that's why we say the normal rule uh, to be safe is 28 days, uh, and that's the minimum. Now, in terms of the maximum, uh, honestly, a, a, a bylaw can sit for over a year. It can sit for up to two years between first reading and when it gets its final readings. That's in terms of the MGA, but that would totally fly in the face of common law, which says that a developer is a right to a decision from council within a reasonable time. So yeah, we could take it longer. You could take it a couple of months more or whatever, but the longer you take it, the more chance it is that you're infringing on the developer's rights to a reasonable time for a decision. It's always a balancing act. So, but I mean, it just goes to Mr. Huzar's request to move it into September. Um, w is that unreasonable? Uh, and I realize that that's really a difficult question because again, common law principles are a lot different than statutes. So, um, I mean, potentially with the circumstances we're under, September isn't that far out of reach. Well, that's again, it's a very good question. We, we looked at the, critically, we looked at the amount of material that there is for someone who's interested in this, who might want to make a submission to council of public hearing, how much material for the, is there for them to go through? How much is already available? As Councillor Watkins has pointed out, there's a tremendous amount of material that was posted on the public website, the city website, uh, up to three months ago. And so the, uh, a great deal of relevant material has already been posted and has been publicly available for a long time. We've been talking about uh, a particular FOIP request that has come from one interested citizen. And of course, that's perfectly legitimate. Anyone can do that. We have noted, as I, as I pointed out, I think a few minutes ago, we've, we've seen now having gone through the documentation, it is not actually that huge of a volume of material. Uh, it's, as I say, it's less, than, less, less paper than it is in your council package today. So bearing all of that in mind, it is our best judgment that uh, it's, it might be, it, you might be at some risk if you put it over as far as September uh, in terms, risk in terms of saying, of the, the proponent, the, the landowner saying, you know, you're making me wait too long. Because you have to bear in mind that time is money, right? And, and, and when the landowner is looking for things that they can do with their land, if they're sitting in limbo for that long, you know, they're tying up money and there's a lost opportunity, right? The opportunity costs come into, into play. Difficult things to balance. So our best judgment is that it would be better to get it done by the end of June, uh, as long as those who are interested and want to make submissions have time by then to look at the material. And, and we genuinely believe that they will. So that, I mean, I guess that's, I guess the only other thing that left outstanding is, is once we are able to get Mr. Barkley the material he's requested through uh, Freedom of Information, um, then um, are we going to be in regular contact with Mr. Barkley to make sure or ensure that uh, he has the su sufficient amount of time or maybe it might even spawn further uh, requests of documents like he mentioned. So, I mean, I guess at points a decision has to be made, but are there other key, um, uh, I guess, key decisions that would potentially uh, have to come back to you in particular or to Mr. Scoble as to uh, making that determination? It, it, even if that's a fair question. 
Well, the, it is a fair question. The, the only thing I think I could usefully add to, to all of this discussion is that uh, if you set a, a public hearing for January 22nd, as is being recommended today in the report, June if something 22nd. unexpected happens, if something mm -hmm. unexpected happens and that day comes, and if any member of the public brings forward new information that and, and requests an adjournment, uh, you, they can ask. I can actually ask for an adjournment at that time. Uh, it's not something you like to do. Uh, I have seen it happen uh, a couple of times in my thirty odd years at the bar. I've seen that happen. It, so it, it's kind of your fail safe. If it, if it gets to that public hearing date, and something that we don't currently anticipate has happened. Uh, or if there's a really good argument that you know the, the the material that's been disclosed to the FOIP request has opened a can of worms, uh, that can be dealt with at that time. So that that's that was another th part of our thinking in saying you know that should be enough time. But knowing that it's not necessarily cast in stone, if council had to postpone the public hearing for a good reason, it could be done. All right, thank you. That's uh, excellent uh, information. I appreciate it. And you've only had 30 years at the bar. Councillor Watkins and myself has had far more time. <laughs> All right, any more questions of administration? Okay. Uh, any questions of administration based on the other presentation from Tuatna Valley Ski Club? Okay, seeing that, we are now moving on to consent agenda. Uh, Mr. LaFleur, we need to remember, so our, my um, my minutes didn't have presentations and then it was, there's that agenda item that always comes after presentations to allow for questions of admin. Business arising, there we go. It was missing. Yeah, that, that's fine. We'll note that in the minutes. <laughs> yes, thanks. Okay. Uh, any member of council want to make a motion for consent? Thank you, Councillor Hansen. So may I clarify, uh, Councillor Hughes had said she might be- she said she's not anymore. Okay. Yeah, no, it's all good. Okay. We can put it back on. Okay, that the recommendations in the following agenda report be approved. 6.1 regular council minutes of April 20th, 2020 and May 4th, 2020 and special council minutes of May 11th, 2020. 7.1 time extension request, expression of interest 22 St. Thomas Street and 21 St. Anne Street. 8.1 bylaws 11, 2020, 12, 2020 and 13, 2020 Oakmont area structure plan land use bylaw amendments first reading. 11.1 information item Q1 financial report and 12.1 civic and external agency counselor updates. Thank you for that, call for the vote. That is unanimous. Moving on to agenda item six was minutes. Moving on from there. So let me read the motion that was just approved on consent. Uh, that the a deadline extension for the following item be approved. Uh, time extension requests for the expression of interest for 22 St. Thomas Street and 21 St. Anne Street be extended to June 29, 2020. And just to be very clear that deadline for the, the submissions for those expressions of interest has come and gone. This is a deadline extension for the report coming to council. Uh, Financial scenario 7.2. So, Ms. McCordy, no, she's waiting for us. <laughs> Go ahead. You have a presentation? Yeah. Okay. Sorry, I'm just having a problem with my. Screen sharing. Uh, there we go. I am going to share. Being technologically challenged here. Mm -hmm. There we go. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> okay. Good afternoon, Madam Mayor and uh, members of Council. So the City of St. Albert, along with all municipalities, are facing significant financial pressures due to COVID-19. 
The closure of many of our facilities and programs by provincial orders have negatively impacted our ability to generate non-tax revenues. The three main service areas being impacted are recreation, culture, and transit. As of May 13th, 2020, the total estimated impact to the city is $1.8 million, which is made up of 900,000 of direct incremental costs and 900,000 of net revenue impacts. On April 30th, 2020, the province of Alberta released the provincial relaunch strategy, which lays out the conceptual reopening of our communities over a series of three stages. The most significant municipal facilities are included in stage three of the provincial plan. However, there is not even a tentative date for implementation for this stage. On April 20th, 2020, Council received a 2020 annual forecast that indicated we could be facing a $6 million deficit if facilities and programs were allowed to come back online on October 1st. For purposes of forecasting, we've chosen to focus on this October 1st date as it seems as it's deemed plausible and not overly optimistic. The current forecast being presented today has a revised 2020 annual forecasted deficit of 3.9 million. As there has been little new definitive information related to the ultimate reopening of phase three facilities since the last financial forecast presented on April 20th, there's been minimal adjustments in the model impacting the assumptions that are driving the forecast specifically related to facility and program closures. What's now been integrated into the forecast are those mitigating strategies equating to approximately 2.7 million that have been approved for implementation to date. Administration has targeted an overall 7% savings of which this 2.7 is considered the first piece. Administration continues to pursue further opportunities for expense reductions and program decisions and this work is at various stages of completion. Some of these items will ultimately require council approval prior to implementation. It is expected that the June financial scenarios update to council will be able to include a more inclusive picture of how we intend and the extent to which we're able to offset any projected deficit. Um, forecasting on a, an October 1st relaunch, while it's plausible, still represents a fairly good scenario. Possible future pressures could include a second wave of the virus causing subsequent closures and or deep economic impacts both locally, regionally, and provincially, impacting both residents and businesses. St. Albert's internal corporate recovery team, as well as Council's Recovery Task Force, will be working over the coming months to assess and plan for these potential scenarios. On March 13th, 23rd, and April 6th, Council approved a total of 2.2 million, million from the Stabilization Fund regarding unbudgeted expenditures related to the City's response to COVID-19. On the forecast attached to today's agenda report, it was stated that 1.8 million has been expended against this approved budget. However, this number in error has included the net revenue loss due to facility closures, which is outside the city's control. Direct expenditures to date in response to the situation are approximately 860,000 and forecasted to about 1.6 million um, for the year 2020. The total impacts of the pandemic, including the net revenue losses though, are what's included in the presented forecast and form part of the overall deficit number that we are working to manage. So I thank you and I'll take any questions that you may have. All right, um, let me just expand my screen. Okay, um, put up your hand if you have any questions. Go ahead, Councillor Hughes. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Ms. Sukmoni, for all this. She's not on my screen, so. Oh, there you are. Okay, oh. I see you. There. <laughs> okay, um, so I had a couple questions. I have people asking me questions I don't have an answer to, so I'm, I'm going to use your expertise while I have it, which is mm -hmm. so, service place, for example, they're saying, okay, we have no revenue, but then in theory, we should also have no expenses because the facility is closed. So, can you help us figure out why we'd still have expenses on that, or substantial expenses, especially considering that we have. The facility is closed. Um, so as you can see on the four pack cast, we've got forecasted revenue impacts, but then below we've got offsetting expense savings. So um, mm -hmm. we, we, we were able to mitigate obviously a, a large majority of the costs um, of service place, but there are components that uh, still need to con continue. So we still um, have utilities for the building. Um, we still have some of our, our permanent recreation staff um, are still there. All of the temporary staff have been gone, but many of the recreation staff as well have also been redeployed or taken temporary layoffs. So we're, we're 
looking at reducing basically wherever we can. Okay. Um, the other question I had was, so we're basically when you have, when I look at this chart you provide us, this is like how much we are losing from one period to the next. Is that right? So like, cause I'm trying to figure out this whole thing. Like right now we're at 480 and then it goes to 1.4 million. So, or 1.1 million. I'm just, I'm trying to figure out that when it has the numbers of total forecasted revenue impact. So the how, green column, the green column on there represents just an estimate of what it would be to May 13th, because we're trying to kind of give a current day estimate. And the next column is for the entire month of May. Okay, so that'd be like from April 20th to May 20th type of thing? No, so the green column would be just May 1st to May 13th. And then okay. the two prior columns are all of March and all of April. Okay, now it makes a bit more sense and it's more consistent. Um, and then the other thing I was wondering, oh, I know this is not really an optimistic thing to say, but we have apparently one in one in 10 people right now are deferring their mortgages. And even if one in 10 of those one in 10 were to forfeit on their mortgages or probably also be forfeiting on their taxes. And even if that, even that's 1%, that would be 240 houses in St. Albert that would basically be affected. So have we have, have we had any thought, and this may not be to you as might be Mr. Scoble as well, I'm not sure, but, um, First of all, have we put that into any of our considerations about potential defaults on being able to pay for the taxes? And the second part of it is, have we put any thought into how we're going to handle the potential homelessness factor that we really did not have in large masses, but we could be facing in the next six to 12 months? Um, so the one thing I'll add, and I, and I see Mr. Dolan is also on the call as well, so if he wants to jump in and correct me, feel free. Um, so one of the things with property taxes is that through the NGA, um, we do have the ability to recover property taxes. So even if people um, do not pay their property taxes, eventually that property will end up going to tax sale, in, at which time we would actually collect our, our taxes on that. So at this point, we're not really forecasting any net uh, loss in revenue from that perspective. And I see Mr. Dolan's just jumped in, so. I can add that uh, one of the things we've been tracking is how many folks have been removing their selves off our monthly pre-authorized plan. Um, the numbers to date, about it's about 350 properties total. So it's about 2% of all residential properties and about 6% of non-residential properties. Um, really all that indicator is, is just saying that they're looking to defer by not making their monthly pre-authorized payment and um, as advised in a previous meeting, we do anticipate that those numbers will increase as we move throughout the months of May, June, and July. Okay. So, and so, do, um, Mr. Scoble, I'm wondering, has there been any discussion about what we'll do if we do have large numbers of people who do default on their mortgages? Um, I mean, this is, I, I'm thinking about the emergency center type of thing. Has there been any discussion about how we would handle that situation because we've never had to handle a situation of that magnitude before. Well, I, I don't know that we have detailed plans at this point, but that, that's part of the psychosocial plan that's uh, been been developed in the EOC there. But really, the next, you know, that's going to really extend into recovery activities. So that's really um, the detailed planning that's underway right now. But I guess you know I should note that uh, the psychosocial component is a is one of the significant components of the, the recovery task force the next item on the agenda so you know that's that's something that would start to be developed there as well if, if that's where the task force wants to go okay um and the and the last question so this um so thank you so that's probably an element that we don't really want to have to face but it may be a reality that we have to somehow manage i mean we, um, we did sorry i guess you know we were doing planning during the early stages for short-term homelessness or immediate homelessness but this is a little bit more of a longer term thing so that would come in our next set of planning which is okay um and so this this chart that we have miss mcmorty that's basically assuming that we are back up and running on october 1st right i mean just this is just the, the lag uh, that's correct. And it also does have built in a bit of a phased implementation as well. So it's not expecting that even if we open October 1st, that our, our revenues would come back like the next day. It does have a phase in built into it as well. Um, obviously, you know, reality will inform, you know, if we've sort of picked the right assumptions, but we tried to recognize the fact that it would take time for our revenues to rebuild um, back up to pre-COVID levels. And so obviously, like we're only going to the end of this year, but when I look at this um, declining issue, 
it would still be going into January and February and potentially March really before we come out of it. When I look at these numbers and the, the slope, it's not going to just end on December 31st. That's correct. So if we, if um, as a, uh, based on the assumptions that we've used in the forecast right now, if we were to open October 1st with a phased implementation, we're, we're expecting that there will still be some impacts into about the first quarter of 2021. Um, but that, that, and then at that point, it should, should be fairly close. Obviously, we have to monitor the situation and things change on, are changing on a daily basis and we have to change our assumptions to go with it. But that's sort of the, the sort of our best guess at this, at this point. So we'd be looking for, for some of those mitigating factors to help move into 2021 as well if we feel like there's going to be um, negative spillover into, into that year. I had somebody ask me a question, which um, I tried to answer, but maybe you'll be able to answer better is if we're short $10 million or 10.6 now, we're estimating, why don't we just take 10.6 out of our capital fund and just cover it that way? And my answer was, you know, handling it through um, like the line of credits and other mechanisms might also um, handle it a little bit better because we'll still have to make up that shortfall in the capital fund. So um, with our plans for how we're going to mitigate this um, projected deficit, which has gone from five to 10 million just because of what the provinces doing the relaunch. Is there a reason why we would not just simply take the this easy answer of just saying, or the quick answer, which is to say, we'll just take it from the capital fund and just postpone a bunch of projects in the capital fund and just take it from there and not worry about it. Right. Um, I, well, I think one of the issues is postponing um, capital projects doesn't really necessarily help us with money. What we would have to do is actually cancel them. Um, and wait for future money to come. One of the one of the um, challenges with that as well, though, is that a large portion of our capital um, is funded through government grants, and so that um, that money is not able to be diverted to operations. So there's only a small portion of it that is basically from our existing reserves, um, and most of our capital reserve money is actually related to our RMR. Um, so that's something that I would obviously highly discourage. Um, you know, using any of the RMR money that we do have, uh, knowing that we already have a long-term shortfall for that. So to me, looking at capital would be kind of a last resort. Um, if we have to, There's, I think there's a lot better options available. Thank you. And I also just wanted to clarify, you mentioned something about a $10 million deficit. So our net projected deficit right now is 3.9 million. Okay. I was looking at the big, looking at the front line, not the bottom number. So that's even better. So we're still projecting a four million dollar at this point. Well, we are at this point, but we have administration is still working on our seven percent target. Um, you know, of which we have found about two point seven million dollars. You know, in the last couple of weeks, so we're still working on that. I mean, our hope is to be able to mitigate um, most, if not all, of the of the projected deficit. Okay, and the stuff that we're finding is it most of it like a one time savings, or is it? Have you had a chance to look at it versus ongoing? potential savings? So most of the stuff that we've identified at this point um, is one time at this point, could be considered um, to move forward into next year, but at this point it's considered one time. It's the further work that we're actually working on right now um, that may have some ability um, to, to bring ongoing savings in right. terms of service re reimagination and some of those pieces into it. Okay, so the only thing I'm confused about right now is just, um, so when we saw this scenarios last time, I thought that if we had an October 1st opening, it would be a larger deficit than 4 million. And now we're it was, I thought it was like seven or nine or something. It was, so for the 2020, the last time we presented the October scenarios, it was 6 million. But now that we found approximately $2.7 million in actionable savings, that's basically what's reduced that deficit. So I haven't okay. changed much in the actual forecast itself, but have just been able to apply those savings against the forecast. The chart's making more sense to me now. Just I'm, I'm slow, but I'm catching up. So we still have basically a six million dollar deficit, but we've already applied the savings that we have to what the net deficit would be projected to be. If that's what I'm understanding. Yes, right? so that we expect our net to be three point nine million now. Okay, but the total deficit really is six. We're just managing to get rid of two point three already. Yes. Right. Okay. Okay. So okay, that's good. Just so people understand the impact of it is an actual. We're trying to find six million dollars somewhere out of this, and we're at two point three. Okay, that's correct. That's, my God. that's it. Uh, I, I got I, I to agree with Councillor Hughes. It wasn't the easiest chart to read. Um, the first one was a little easier because you had lost revenues separated from incurred expenses. And it, the, it does make a little more sense now you've explained it. I have a quick question before I think um, I saw, whose hand did I see go up? Councillor Hansen's, right. 
Um, so council covered our budgets, uh, each each individually, and and then I I came up with about forty one thousand out of the mayor's office. Has that been applied to to this already? Yes, because that would have been in the approved budget because um, we made those motions back in December. We just so did it's already, yeah. And it was it's new savings all pretty much one time, maybe one or two that could could go further, you know, for the for this year. We, I think you all submitted it last week, didn't you? Yeah. So there you go. Another okay. maybe fifty thousand dollars for you. <laughs> I will make Perfect. sure that Leanne uh, sends that to you. Okay, okay. Council Manson. Uh, thanks, Mayor. So for today, looking at the recommendations, there really isn't a decision to be made. We're receiving it as information and we're going to uh, watch for your updates on a regular basis. That yeah, correct? that's that's correct. We're just we're just providing monthly updates so that council is aware of where where we stand and, and especially in terms of our our goal to help offset this deficit. Excellent. Um, I'd be prepared to make the motion, Mayor, if there are no other questions. All right, I'll come back to you if that is the case. Anyone else have any questions? Go ahead, Councillor Broadhead. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, just a question around process. So uh, there's a number of, of, I don't know if I want to call them advocacy groups, but I guess that's what they are, dealing with the province and with the federal government in terms of achieving support. One of them I happen to sit on is, is the Urban uh, Transit Association, and they've made a representation to the federal government for uh, funding relief based on lost revenue. I, do we have somebody on staff, Mr. Scoville, that's watching for these things, or how does that play? Uh, yeah, well, as as announcements are made or programs are made, yes, we're we're watching all that through a combination of finance and and the emergency operations plan. Yeah, is there like there's been a lot of talk. There hasn't been any uh, uh, any substantive things come through yet, have there? Uh, not not too much. No, we are like you said. We we are watching. We you know we we got some indication there might be some in the next couple of weeks. Um, but you know we're we're seeking some clarification as well. For example, on the rent subsidy, uh, for example, um, and it, this may even be going through associations as well. But is, does does that extend to municipal governments as landlords? You know where we have have tenants and that sort of thing. So, if anything, we're we're seeking clarification on some of the stuff that's come out. So, fair enough, Madam Mayor, you may know better than any of us around what AMA is doing. Any any word there uh, in terms of relief coming back to the municipalities? AUMA's uh, efforts have been focused mostly on advocating to the federal government. Fair enough. And, and I, mean, I think it was almost two or three weeks ago that I participated in the finance committee. So nothing has been mentioned um, from the federal government. So our, uh, we are requesting that the premier get involved with that advocacy. So EMRB sent a message, AUMA has done the same thing, just asking Mr. Kenny to at least stand beside us in, in support, because I, I, I understand that provincial government does not have a lot of funds to help us with right now. And so the only thing provincially is this yet to be announced, but quite publicly, talked about maybe even promised is capital stimulus for municipalities, but our shovel ready projects are sitting there and we, we're just waiting to hear what they're gonna do with that. So. Fair yeah. enough, thank you. Appreciate it's not, that update. It's not great news. <laughs> it all comes from the same pocket. We all recognize that, but uh, some have access to that pocket better than municipalities do, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Scoble, I think this is more of a question for you. I think what is going to be needed as we continue to go forward and as long as EOC is up and operating is, I, we, there's still questions in the community about what the $2 million in, in response is, what, what's, what are we getting for that money? And I, I, I actually struggle with, with telling residents what we're spending that money on. And, and so I think we still need further breakdowns and details of sign you know, make purchasing signs or overtime costs or because I, it, I'm having a hard time justifying where that $2 million is going. So maybe in the June report, we could have a bit better of a breakdown of 
not the I, I totally get the revenue loss those costs but it's the expenses that we did not budget for that I'm having a hard time explaining yeah for sure and and we're, we're working on that but to be clear it's it's eight eight hundred thousand right that that is a little bit of an error that Diane pointed out earlier so we've got eight hundred thousand in direct costs for you know extra bus cleaning and building cleaning and Mm -hmm. all the safety gear to meet the provincial standards that the employees have to wear and that but we, we, we're putting that together and we can we can provide that thank you that would be very helpful all right councillor hansen i see no more questions so i'm going to look to you to make a motion thank you mayor just pull up my my screen um i move that the may 19th 2020 agenda report titled covid 19 financial scenarios be received as information Number two, that administration provide monthly financial updates as more revenue and expense data becomes available and modeling is refined to inform any further financial management decisions required of council. Excellent. Uh, accept that motion and I'll let you go into some opening comments. Uh, thank you. I, you know, I think the questions are really good. Uh, I appreciate the que your question. Mayor around just uh, articulating what our expenses are. Um, and I wanna just thank uh, Mr. Scoble and uh, Ms. McMarty for all their work on this. This is, uh, this, is, this is never meant to be a conversation at council and we are uh, doing really well as a city in terms of uh, how we're responding to a pandemic. So um, financially and otherwise, so appreciate it. All right, anyone else have any comments? Go ahead, Councillor Hughes. Thank you. I wanted just to uh, just reiterate, like we have a $6 million deficit on this and we're 2.4 million towards finding those savings. And this was a very large initiative by the city manager and administration to try to find these savings. This is not a simple task when you're dealing with mostly personnel and operating costs. And um, so we're at a $4 million still need to find solution and we're with a $6 million deficit. And I just want to acknowledge where we've gotten to today because the six or $7 million that we're trying to find is not a simple way to just find it. And uh, we may or may not achieve that goal, but we are now towards like, when I think of like United Way, you know, they try to get X dollars. We're trying to get to 6 million right now and we're at 2.4. Whether we reach the 6 million or not, I think we need to acknowledge what we have accomplished to date. I understand we're gonna have more information about where we are further progress in the past month, we're gonna get that next month. Um, but we are basically still trying to find $4 million to handle what we have this year. And that does not even cover the deficit of next year um, to also make more than that. But I just want to acknowledge where we are and just make sure people understand that we don't have a $4 million deficit, we have a $6 million deficit and we've dealt with 2.4 million towards that. So that was it, thank you. Anyone else? I'm seeing no more hands going up. Dan, Kevin, really good work so far. Um, I actually questioned Kevin if he really wanted to get rid of the vacancy pool because it was a good good pool for hiring um, staff that we didn't need to go back to the taxpayer, but he's made some really tough decisions and uh, so is all of our staff and everybody's making sacrifices. So, um, you know, there's no magic wand to fix this. And so the hard work will come for the seven of us at the end of this year when we do have a deficit, whether it's another four, or maybe we've got it down to two or whatever that looks like, we're gonna have to figure out how we're gonna cover that off. And those will be the conversations that we will really need to be involved with, so. And of course, there's always these opportunities of all the savings that we're finding that are particular to this one year, but that could be um, applied moving forward. Councillor Hansen, too close. Nothing more, thank you very much. Call for the vote. Unanimous. All right, 7.3 COVID-19 Recovery Task Force. Uh, birthday Girl has volunteered to make the motion. <laughs> <laughs> First of all, before, I, before we go straight to the motion, is there any questions? Okay, good. All right, Councillor Hanson, go ahead. I just have to find it, sorry. It's okay. Uh, what page is it on in our package? Page 60. 60, thank you. There we go. 
uh, that Councillors Mackay and Hanson be appointed as the council members of the City of St. Albert COVID-19 Recovery Task Force for terms expiring December 31st, 2020. Uh, and that the following persons be appointed as public members of the City of St. Albert COVID-19 Recovery Task Force for terms expiring December 31st. Do you have the names? I do not, Mayor. I do. I do. I, I okay, can jump in if that's possible. Okay. Well, that's then, perfect. Then hold on. I'm going to accept the first motion. Let's vote okay. on the appointments of uh, Councillor Mackay and Councillor Hansen first, and then I'll go to you, Ken. You can read the names. Excellent. Uh, Councillor Watkins, did you, you just threw up your hand. Do you have a question? Oh, you, you were voting? <laughs> I like how fast he moves. All right, all those in oh, favor. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Okay, that's unanimous. All right, Councillor Mackay, why don't you make the second motion and read the names? Sure, that the following persons be appointed as public members of the City of St. Albert COVID-19 Recovery Task Force for terms expiring December 31st, 2020. When I read the names, uh, Madam Mayor, do you want me to uh, identify a little bit about them or just read the name? You can say a few, a bit about them. All right. Yeah. yeah, no, I can, I can certainly do it. First of all, uh, well, I won't, I'll just read the names and a little bit about them. I won't uh, get into much because we can cover that if debate, unless you want me to expire, nope, uh, you're good. keep on talking. Um, anyways, uh, I um, start off in alphabetical order. Uh, a person that we all know in our community as a strong social and community advocate, Sandine Beach McCutcheon. Uh, our second selection um, was, is Mr. Dan Holman, who's also very well known in our business community. He is in fact a uh, 25 years plus of uh, diverse retail business development and uh, is a coach and mentor to many businesses in our community, as well as active on uh, numerous uh, boards, including the Sturgeon Hospital Community Foundation. Uh, the third member of our task force is Mr. Jason Cripps. Uh, Mr. Cripps, a lawyer by uh, uh, education, is currently the uh, um, uh, president and chief executive officer of Alberta Force Products Association. But prior to that, he had an extensive experience working in uh, provincial governments, six plus years as a deputy uh, minister leading numerous departments. Uh, so we're all very excited to have his involvement on the task force. And then our uh, fourth member is uh, Jennifer McCurdy. Uh, she's the president and CEO of the St. Albert District Chamber of Commerce. And again, very much a strong advocate for business and uh, works in our community on many uh, boards and committees. Uh, our fifth member is Ms. Susan Munson. She's the uh, real estate developer. She's vice president at uh, Melcor. She's also uh, involved in the Urban Development Bo uh, Institute Board of Directors and is a St. Albert Charter member. Um, then we uh, have number six individual on our task force is Mr. Nick Parkinson, who is the president and CEO of YMCA Northern Alberta. And he brings um, 31 years of a senior leadership and experience on um, even how to um, uh, community engagement, social housing. So also extremely excited to have him. And the last member of our uh, recovery task force is Mr. Alan Tom. He's an associate partner at Ernst & Young and has a uh, 30 plus years of work uh, in government and public sector and, and involved in a lot of large scale transformation projects. So those are the seven members, Madam Mayor. Okay, so Cheryl, the motion is actually the names, not all the <laughs> verbiage around it. <laughs> you, I asked. I, know. I, asked. I, was just, I think they deserve that. So, um, so the motion essentially would read uh, that the following persons be appointed as public members of the St. Albert or City of St. Albert COVID-19 Recovery Task Force for terms expiring December 31st, 2020. Number one, and this is actually, I'll do it in the same order, uh, Sandy Beach McCutcheon. Then we had uh, Dan Holman, Jason Cripps. Now I can't do alphabetical. Jen McCur Nick McCarks, uh, Parkinson, Alan Tom, and Sue Watson. Do you have the name? Okay. Any uh, comments from members of council? Councillor Broadhead, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, it, 
it was certainly a, a, an honor and a pleasure as a city council member to sit down and interview these folk. What, uh, what I'd like to tell the people of St. Albert is that we had 40 some odd applicants, all of which could have filled the role, quite honestly. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and yet uh, uh, the seven of us uh, sat down and talked with them and came up with uh, who we believe could best uh, lead our community through this uh, coming months. And, uh, and I'm uh, quite honestly uh, gratified that they're there and I'm confident in the capacity and the wisdom uh, in the committee as a whole to, to move our organization forward. So anyway, just my comments. Those are good comments. Anyone else? Go ahead, Councillor Hansen. Yeah, I just also want to, um, you know, publicly um, thank my colleagues on council for uh, giving me this opportunity to sit on the task force. Uh, and I'm sure Councillor Mackay feels the same way. Uh, I'm really, really looking forward to spending some time with these people um, and picking their brains and, and looking at the uh, creativity around what a recovery looks like for our city. I think uh, we're lucky to be in the position we are with all the folks that applied and I uh, wish we could have taken more, but you know, that gets unruly. So um, it's going to be um, an exciting time to sit with these folks and talk about the future. Thank you. Excellent. Um, I'll just finish with thanking the six of you for um, putting this in your calendar for last Friday to do that quick special council meeting and do all those interviews. Um, appreciate your time. Appreciate the members of council who did indicate interest to sit as um, appointees on this committee. As you know, uh, it was completely random. We drew names out of a hat to get the final candidates of Councillor Mackay and Councillor uh, Hansen, and I don't know if I should congratulate you or, or apologize because this is going to be a fair amount of work. And then, uh, yes, to the members of uh, the public that applied and did not make the final cut, thank you for your uh, time. Thank you for your interest. Any one of these members would have been fantastic. The decision was really not that simple. And then to those that those seven that will be sitting to work on this um, innovation and creativity to find recovery for the city of St. Albert. I do believe we've got a balance. We've got some good understanding of the business sector, board governance, and, uh, and the social side. Uh, so it will be a very integrated model, and I um, look forward to working with all of you. All right, so call for that vote. That's unanimous. Sorry, Councillor McKay, did you want to close? No, I thought you did a good job as well as Councillor Broadhead. All right. Okay, moving on. 7.4, Ray Gibbon Drive Phase 1. Is Donnie, there she is, popped in. Hi, Donnie. Hi. Can you Hi. Do you have a, yeah, wait, do you have a presentation? I have a verbal update of the room. Okay. Good afternoon, uh, Mayor and Council. Thank you for the opportunity to present this report on a recently found opportunity to complete improvements to support mitigation of traffic operation concerns experienced at two intersections outside the city of St. Albert boundary, namely Anthony Hendy Drive at 184th Street and Ray Gibbon Drive at Old 137 Avenue. I'm Donnie George, Director of Engineering, and I'm also joined by Dean Schick, Manager of Transportation, who may be, able, may be able to answer some of the questions that council may have. As background, administration has been working collaboratively in the past year or so with the city of Edmonton and Alberta Transportation in addressing the concerns regarding traffic operations experienced at the subject intersections. St. Albert and Alberta Transportation have committed and commenced widening of the Ray Gibbon Drive corridor over four phases with the overall corridor designed and constructed over the next 10 years. Phase one is from the south city limit to approximately 500 meters north of the Leclerc Way intersection, including improvements of Leclerc Way from Re Real Drive to Ray Gibbon Drive, and it's scheduled for construction this year with the expected start of construction in two weeks. Although widening of Ray Gibbon Drive and the associated intersection improvements within St. Albert will improve the overall capacity and address condition accommodation, the existing old 137 Ave intersection and its proximity to the other intersections of Leclerc Way and Anthony Henday 
pose a challenge for optimal vehicular movement during peak periods. The interim improvements currently proposed will only mitigate or minimize um, short to medium term operational concern. The long term plan of the old 137 Nav intersection is that it'll be closed and access to the city of Edmonton and St. Albert developments on the west side of Reykjavik and south of Leclerc Way would be via an extension of Leclerc Way to the west. The extension of Leclerc Way is not within any approved funding plan nor near term municipal plans of either Edmonton or St. Albert. St. Albert administration has confirmed that both the city of Edmonton and Alberta transportation are supportive of the improvements and the proposed plan of action presented this afternoon, including a commitment from the city of Edmonton to reimburse the estimated improvement cost of $520,000. A formal agreement is being prepared to be executed between the three parties in the coming weeks. With council's approval of the scope, the proposed interim improvement plans presented here are anticipated to be accomplished and completed in the 2020 construction season through a scope change to phase one of Reagan Drive construction budget without adding additional funds to the already approved Reagan Drive project charter and the budget. Here is the proposed outline and how it can be done. Estimates of construction of phase one of Reagan Drive are a total of 7.9 million. This is the value utilized for the cost sharing agreement with the province. The received successful construction bid for the phase one improvement is approximately 6.2 million and is, it is now awarded to Standard General. Allowing a contingency factor of 15% of the received tender price, which is approximately $935,000, leaves the remaining uncommitted funds for phase one construction at approximately $749,000. The estimated value of design and construction of the additional improvement presented today are estimated to be about $520,000, which is within the remaining approved funds of the project and do not require new funds to be approved by council. The additional scope change valued at $520,000 requested is within the 10% limit of change order, but exceeds the CAO's authority of approval within the council policy CCAO 01 to a limit of $250,000. Therefore, administration is recommending that a scope change of an anticipated value greater than 250,000 be approved to capital project number 419424, Ray Gibbon Drive Corridor Improvements Phase 1 construction to complete improvements to two intersections, Anthony Hende Drive at 184th Street and Ray Gibbon Drive at Old 137 Avenue. Thank, thank you, and we would be happy to answer any question that council may have. Thank you, Donnie. Quick question. The Westbound exit off of the Hende, is it, are we just going to be putting barricades up because we probably will want to reopen that in the future, right? That's a temporary closure that we're proposing as part of the plan. Right. Any other questions? Go ahead, Councillor Mackay. Thank you uh, for the presentation. Just for clarification, so will this close off? And I, I think it will. I was trying to look on our, our uh, map that was presented. So will this permanently close off the 137 Avenue and 184th Street uh, on the east side of, uh, of that intersection? Maybe Dean can jump in and explain. So yeah, uh, thank you, Councilman McKay. Uh, no, there, there will still be access maintained to the east side of the old 137th Avenue intersection. It's just gonna be a slightly redesigned right turn movement. So right now, it, the residents into Starling and Trumpeter uh, come off and because they can't get the arrow to turn into that development, they turn right into 137th Avenue, do a U-turn and go across uh, 180 or, or Ray Gibbon Drive and then back into Star, uh, Starling and Trumpeter. So they will still be able to do that? They will, except that's one of the reasons for the redesign is actually to deter that. And so the improvement actually accommodates that northbound left uh, a lot better, a lot mm -hmm. uh, safer, and hopefully will minimize that, uh, maybe that, that perception of that benefit of going uh, eastbound, U-turn, and then back westbound through the intersection. All right. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's in, it, <clears throat> the only, my, my concern only as a St. Albert resident is, is it just plugs up that one lane is all in front. As people want to 
don't want to wait for the left hand turn northbound. So um, when we found the extra, so is the next stage of the Ray Gibbon, I mean, and I realize some of this is really in our shovel ready, is the next stage then to McKinney, is that part of, is that now going to be in the planning stage? Uh, is that where that is now? That's correct. So we are just putting together the tender package for the design of uh, actually the next three phases, two, three, and four. There's going to be some hopeful mm -hmm. um, cost savings and efficiencies found by doing the re remaining work. But the yeah. focus would be design ready of phase two for construction in 2021. Great. Thank you. Uh, the intersection at 137th, that's in Edmonton. Is that their jurisdiction? Uh, the intersection itself is actually within the transportation utility corridor, and so it's the pr province's intersection, oh, the old 137th it's, Ave it's, and Reagan. It's and stuff on the lights for that intersection. Alberta Transportation does? That's correct, yes. Yeah. But is I, it my understanding that, that St. Albert will be able to use some of our intelligent transportation systems to, to synchronize the, that light a bit better? That's correct. Right, right now, the intersection is not coordinated or optimized. Um, and so we're in a discussion and just finalizing an agreement between Alberta Transportation and City of St. Albert to bring that intersection on our monitoring and our system and, and hopefully look to optimize it for coordination. Right. I shouldn't say synchronize, it's optimized, right? <laughs> it. Any other right. questions? Yeah. Seeing none, I need a member of council to make the motion. Look at y'all look away. Councillor Broadhead. <laughs> You're still muted. How's that? That's great. All right. Let me just. Uh... All right. I move that I recommend uh, that a scope change of an anticipated value greater than 250,000 be approved to capital project number 419424, uh, Rave Gibbon Drive Corridor Improvements Phase 1 Construction to complete improvements to two intersections, Anthony Hende Drive at 184th Street and Ray Gibbon Drive at the old 137th Avenue. All right, accept that motion. Do you have anything to say about it, Wes? Well, only uh, that, uh, you know, sometimes uh, construction costs and tenders come in advantageous. <laughs> opportunity to take advantage of that, so. Um, I'll just add, you know, the behind the scenes on, on this decision has been, um, there's been a lot of work. You know, we didn't want to do a full twinning of phase one of Ray Gibbon Drive and just build more parking lot space, as Mr. Scoble always says. We need to have it flow on the Edmonton side of the border uh, as well. So there was a lot of work between um, Mr. Scoble and the city manager in, in Edmonton and Don Iveson and myself, and of course, Alberta Transportation. I think do we all we all got copied on how quickly Alberta Transportation responded to this request, and so there's a lot of um, three-way goodwill um, and and trust in, in the, this tri-party agreement. And tomorrow, when we do the official groundbreaking of um, the twinning of Ray Gibbon Drive, uh, the minister will be there. So we need to express our thanks to him as tomorrow, Minister MacGyver and his whole team. So yeah, a lot of uh, a lot of work was done to get this in place just so we could have free flowing traffic on Ray Gibbon Drive. So anything to close, Councillor Broadhead? Nothing further, Madam Mayor. All right, call for the vote. That is unanimous. And it's almost four o'clock. It's been two hours. Do you guys feel like a 10 minute bio break? Health break, sorry. <laughs> okay, uh, we'll come back at 410, how's that? Okay.
8.1 uh, bylaws. Oh, this was on consent. This was the Oakmont. Sorry, I have two mouses going. I'll just read into the record what we approved on consent. Uh, that bylaw 11 2020 Oakmont area structure plan amendment um, being amendment for the Oakmont area structure plan 1297 redesignating the subject lands from commercial and low density residential to mixed use be read a first time. Uh, number two, that bylaw 12 2020 being amendment 176 to the land use bylaw 9 2005 to redistrict the subject property from direct control to direct control mixed use be read a first time. Uh, that bylaw 13, 2020 being amendment 177 of the land use bylaw 9, 2005 to enact textual changes to the direct control mixed use district and amendments to schedule F building heights for redevelopment be read a first time. And that a public hearing for bylaw 11, 2020, bylaw 12, 2020 and bylaw 13, 2020 be scheduled for June 22nd 2020 at 9am. All right, so that was on consent. Now we have uh, two more bylaws that I think we should probably be able to get through pretty quickly. 8.2 is our tax rate bylaw. Um, I don't know if there's a need for presentation. Mr. Dahl, do you have anything prepared? Hi, yeah, there is a presentation. There's a PowerPoint. Um, I can uh, yeah, I can vary. I can vary my speed so I can get through it fairly succinctly, if you'd like. No, let's take your time. Okay. And is that shared now that you can see? Yes, it is. Okay. Twenty twenty tax rate bylaw. Um, there's three parts to the PowerPoint presentation. Um, And if it will, there we go. First part is just summary of our 2020 tax rates. Um, so as was finalized on May 11th, our municipal levy summary for 2020 will be 109,220,000. Very generally, that's made up of three components. The first is our general municipal. Um, the second is our ongoing service place capital levy. And the third is the um, need to include the annexed lands uh, levy um, for the 2007 Sturgeon County annexation lands. In addition, we also do the requisitioning for the province of the education uh, requisition amount. Um, in addition, the homeland housing requisition is a responsibility of the city to administer and collect. And thirdly, we have a small designated industrial property or DIP for short requisition, um, which is a small amount of money that we requisition and is sent to municipal affairs. So total property tax requisition for municipal and these uh, additional requisitions is just under $145 million for 2020. Um, we continue to operate on our general municipal on a split tax basis. This is the tax rates um, that we will be using as part of the tax rate bylaw uh, for 2020. Uh, we continue to have a policy in place where we tax vacant residential lands that have been vacant for more than seven years at a rate that is 25% higher than our general municipal tax rate for residential. For 2020, there's about 14 residential lots that are affected by this. Um, and uh, I believe that this policy is set for update and renewal next year to council. Service capital uh, tax rates, uh, we have a uniform tax rate basis in place. So one tax rate for all properties. You see that that is a 20 year debenture. Um, Noteworthy is that in 2020, this is actually the 16th year of the levy, so that, that will end or conclude in 2024. So there is uh, light at the end of the uh, tunnel in terms of that debenture payment. Education tax rates, um, despite the fact that the province froze its uniform equalized tax rates, uh, we did have an education requisition increase in St. Albert. 
uh, about 34.4 million uh, with differing outcomes to the res class versus the non-res class. Homeland housing tax rates, uh, the requisition amount for 2020 increased slightly to 1.20 million from 1.16. Uh, new assessment growth helps to offset the increase and we continue to collect and levy that uh, on behalf of Homeland for operation of seniors housing within the region. And again, there's about 30 properties in the city or less that uh, get the designated industrial rate. This is our linear property, um, some miscellaneous oil and gas sites that are dispersed throughout our city limits. And again, it's a uh, very small requisition amount. Uh, they collect about $6,100 from us and they do the assessment of those properties themselves as opposed to our local assessors. So there's the total of all those components. You'll see that for 2020, our tax rates for residential is just over 11 mils. And for non-residential, we're at about 14.66 mils. Um, we show a series of two graphs just to show where we place uh, fundamentally with other municipal comparators in terms of our tax rates. So this first chart shows our residential tax rates. Uh, the green portion of the bar here is the St. Albert municipal tax rate. The red on top is um, the education portion of taxes. So you'll see that in Alberta currently there is about five other cities within Alberta that do have a higher residential tax rate than St. Albert. Um, there's a couple of cities that are very close to us and then cascading downwards. Um, in the same basis on a non-residential tax rate, you'll see that St. Albert is at about the 60th percentile. There are quite a few uh, municipal comparators that do have a higher non-residential tax rate than we do. Um, our neighbors, of course, big brother to the uh, beside us, City of Edmonton, um, you would see here they have this market difference, about a 30% difference in, in total tax rate between ourselves and Edmonton. So um, uh, that's relatively good news for us that we're positioned here. Section two, um, overview of the 2019 assessment rule. So customarily with, with this presentation, we have a few slides that we give that shows what's happened with our assessment role. Um, again, when we prepare the assessment role for annual use, it's based on market value premise using mass appraisal. Importantly for COVID this year is that the fact that uh, the public should be very aware that it's July the 1st of 2019, which is the valuation date. Um, we suspect that many people will look at their assessments this year and the value of their home and wonder if it's dropped due to COVID. Um, the answer to that would be no, not yet. Um, because your assessment that you're looking at on your assessment tax notice is again based on pre-COVID valuation date of July 1st of last year. So July 1st of 2020 will come into play next year when we're in consideration of the 2021 tax year. Related to that is the physical condition of your home. It's based on December 31st of 2019. So any construction that was um, happening on properties will reflect an assessment as of the state of that date. Our role was audited by Municipal Affairs who concluded that at the end of February um, and, or sorry, at the end of April, 2020 and our assessment role did pass all audit requirements. Very quickly, statistical snapshot. We have, we're approaching 29,000 parcels of property that have to be uh, valued each year. Our total taxable assessment base in St. Albert is about two and a half billion dollars. Um, primarily St. Albert continues to be made up of residential property on a parcel basis. So we have over 18,000 single family homes. We have over 6,000 condominium or semi-detached type properties. And we have about 800 non-residential properties that are part of our valuation portfolio. Our taxable assessment base, this just highlights the fact that um, our tax base has certain property types that are exempted from paying tax. And again, these haven't changed. There are schools, our churches, the majority of our city owned property, um, college and universities um, and hospitals and nursing homes. 
This just shows uh, the stability in our tax base, which is important. Um, St. Albert for the 2020 tax year is the green bar. Uh, this should read 12.48 billion. So we haven't seen a catastrophic decrease in our assessment base from a taxability perspective. So that is good. Um, every municipality is always striving for stability in their taxing and their tax base. In 2019, we had just under 2% taxable assessment growth. Um, that was about $237 million in new development and construction. Um, the new reality in St. Albert, as you'll see in the pie graph, 45% of that came from our multifamily residential component. Um, 10 years ago, you would have seen this being largely from our single family residential, but we now have had considerable movement in the last several years in the multifamily component. So 45% from multifamily, you can see 28% of growth came from single family and the residual 27% from our non-residential base, which is commercial and industrial. Um, lots of information within this graph. This is really included. Just I wanted to make you aware of when it comes to talking about what is growth like in uh, the city of St. Albert in terms of assessment growth. We focus really here today just on this red line, which is the two year um, weighted moving average. And looking at the axis here, you can see that over the last 10 years, we're consistently getting taxable assessment growth that falls between about 2% and 3%. So again, uh, a sign of stability, you can see that there has been a downward trend over the last five years. Um, so it's always interesting to see what the next year will bring in terms of assessment growth. Market value change is an important part of the task of the assessment staff. Uh, we do considerable analysis to measure this and report this to the province and have this inherent in the new assessed values that every property owner receives. Um, so the year over year market value change with the asterisk again is is letting the public know that this is a reflection of the market value change from July 1st of 2018 to July 1st of 2019. That is a legislated time frame. Um, so you can see that residential market value change for all types of residential uh, thrown into uh, one composite average is just over uh, or just over 2% as a decrease in value. Um, non-residential was up about 1.3%. Uh, and when you weight all properties together, the overall market change is about uh, negative 1.6%. There's two statistics. Uh, we often talk in St. Albert about our, our assessment split and our tax split. So our assessment split uh, is now at 84-16, which means 84% residential, 16% non-residential. It moved about seven-tenths of a percentage uh, in the most recent year due to market value change and growth composition. Section three, finally, is 2020 tax impacts. Um, in St. Albert, we've had general stability in this um, composition of, our, of whom we pay taxes to. So three quarters or 75% is our municipal tax. About 24% uh, of the total that, that folks pay is the education tax and about 1% is our homeland housing tax. Um, importantly, and this stems from the uh, council decisions uh, of May 11th in terms of the motions, uh, for 2020, our municipal tax split will be about 80.1% residential and about 19.9% non-residential. And that's a slight regression of about a tenth of a percent uh, as compared to what our tax split was in 2019. Um, each of these components of tax uh, does their, has their own um, realities in terms of what impacts are. So the, the large blue piece, which is our municipal component, um, on average, you'll see about a 1.9% increase for resident, uh, residential property and about 0% increase for non-residential property. Our homeland housing was quite stable where we had uh, uh, small increases experienced there, 1.5% for res, 
0% for non-res, and again, only accounts for 1% of the total tax levy. The education tax impact uh, had some variation this year. Um, on average, residential property will see about a 1.6 decrease in their education tax and about an 8% increase for non-residential properties. And again, this counts for just under one quarter of total tax. Importantly for 2020, there is COVID related property tax relief items that came before council. Um, residents will see a cancellation of the April 1st and July 1st penalty dates for taxes in arrears. So this means that anyone that was already um, in tax arrears coming into 2020, instead of being inundated with further penalties on April the 1st and July the 1st, those have been cancelled. So that is a form of tax relief in that those properties um, will not receive further penalties, which would further encumber them in this COVID period. Secondly is the deferral of 2020 uh, tax payment deadline to September 30th. So no penalties will apply at present to overdue tax accounts until October 1st. In a typical year, the first tax penalty would be experienced on July the 1st. So this is allowing all taxpayers and property owners within the city of St. Albert to have an additional 90 days at present in order to pay their taxes. Thirdly is the regressing uh, very slightly of the 2020 tax split to allow for a 0% municipal tax increase to non-residential properties, AKA the business community. Um, two slides here that just very briefly show examples of uh, typical property types. So this is the residential example, and these are uh, numbers that uh, are identical to the numbers that were shown in the May 11 uh, council meeting. For a residential property that last year was worth 450,000, it's experienced that uh, about 2% value decrease year over year. So it's now 440,000 dollar house for example um, the municipal levy has increased by in the green bar about 1.9 percent but because of education uh, reductions and minimal change in the homeland housing levy in the yellow uh, block you see that the overall tax change is about one percent or the equivalent of about fifty dollars per year in the non-residential example um, you see that uh, a warehouse example that has went up by about 1.3% year over year to a million dollars uh, is showing in the green bar as a 0% uh, municipal levy change. Um, the education tax uh, does weight up the tax increase but is only a quarter of the total. So you'll see in the yellow box that their overall tax increase for the year is about 1.9% or about $276 uh, again, for the $1 million property and paying totals in the uh, 14400 to 14700 kind of $700 range. Um, important notes for senior property owners in St. Albert, um, the Seniors Homeowner Tax Grant Program continues for 2020 and importantly, it is now $200 uh, per eligible household and that was a previous council decision. Um, we budget, uh, that should show the 2020 budget is 120,000, not 90. It would be about 600 properties that will get that $200 seniors tax grant. The seniors uh, also have the ability to do a tax deferral program as administered through the province of Alberta. Um, this continues for 2020. Um, the last two years, we've had about 82 properties. I anticipate for 2020, it will be at least 80. Um, and that, again, is something that the province of Alberta uh, largely handles on our behalf. And with that, I'll take any questions that you might have. Excellent. Uh, thanks so much, Greg. Any questions? Councillor Mackay? Uh, just a curious question. Uh, Mr. Dolan, why did the education tax bump up so much for uh, non-res, 8.1%? Yeah, there's a number of factors in play when we get the requisition for the province each year. And um, I have about four that I can articulate to you. 
One would be the uniform provincial tax rates that the province chooses to use. Uh, this year, they started out by increasing them, but as a COVID tax relief decision, they had uh, froze those. Um, so the, the rates this year were frozen, but there was still an increase in St. Albert, um, largely because this is due to the change in the reported equalized assessment that St. Albert reports to the province on a year over year basis. Um, there can also be change in the underlying provincial education budget. And lastly, there can be change in provincial policy on how much of the education funding will come from property tax as opposed to provincial general revenues. But we don't know exactly which one of those four scenarios, or is it a combination of all, or we don't um, know which one? Yeah, it would be a combination of uh, the change year over year of our equalized assessment base, and then combined with um, the effects of uh, the increase in the in the uh, education budget affecting St. Albert itself. Okay. I just found that interesting. What, yes. All right. Appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Broadhead. Thank you, Madam Mayor. <clears throat> Um, Mr. Dolan, you talked about a, a differential tax rate for undeveloped um, residential land uh, that's been undeveloped in excess of seven years. Uh, two questions. First, do you get any sort of feedback from these property owners uh, in relation to this council policy? Yes, we do from time to time take inquiries, um, more so back in 2015, 2016, when the policy was new. Um, in recent years, you know, because the numbers are so low with only 14 properties being affected, we occasionally will get a call from, from one of those owners. Um, certainly each year um, as properties move off because a house has been built, um, they disappear, but new ones can come on from lots that have now kind of surpassed that seven year mark with being undeveloped. So if it's a new pro, I, I think this year we had two new properties come on. So in general, the inquiries um, are more, uh, I guess, informative and educational if they're not aware of the policy per se. Okay, fair enough. You sort of answered my second question, whether or not uh, there had been any movement in terms of development on these properties and, and, and you, if I can paraphrase your response, is that it's slowly uh, uh, moving? Is that, is that uh, a fair statement? Yeah, I think so. Um, my recollection is that, you know, five years ago, there was 20 some properties on the list and then we had kind of a spurt of construction of some of these and there's a couple of pockets in a couple of neighborhoods where a lot of these come from. So it's, I think it's just a matter of time until, until these are gone. And um, so the policy itself seems to be uh, having the intended consequences of council's kind of original desire on it. Okay, fair enough. Uh, just one other question then. So properties that were uh, commercial uh, and have been made vacant uh, simply because, well, let's name it. So a gas station once placed, the gas station is no longer there, but it's a brownfield and the brownfield sits empty. What's, what's the tax rate on that? Is it a commercial rate still or how does that? Yeah, yeah it's the same commercial rate. And um, this particular vacant lands policy right from its introduction was not contemplative of non-residential property. Um, and the re there's a couple of reasons for that. At the time that this policy was initiated, um, the focus at that time from council was for administration to bring forward a policy that would, that would touch on just residential. And also at the time there was some uh, rules within the MGA that would not allow municipalities to create subsets of non-residential property and tax them differently. Um, some of those rules have since changed um, so if, if there was desire to start looking at uh, um, higher rate of taxation on non-residential properties per se that are vacant, um, then that would be something that uh, administration would have to do some research into. Fair enough. That, that would be an interesting question to explore a little bit. Not so much around vacant as opposed to 
brownfields. But in any case, thanks for those answers. That's all I had, Madam Mayor. All right, who's next? Anyone? Okay, Councillor Hughes. Thank you. Um, the Homeland Housing, we don't have any say on what the requisition is, do we? We don't, no. Um, technically speaking, we receive the requisition amount from Homeland. Um, so we have no direct involvement in the figure per se. Okay. Um, the other question I had was, this isn't directly related to those taxes, but if someone knows it, Greg, you'll know it, is um, when we approved the budget in, Dece in December, it was like a $200 million budget, including capital. But when it came forward to us a few weeks ago, it was at 300 million. And I'm just trying to figure out where that other 100 million, why it would be a $300 million budget when it was 200 million before, what am I missing in the accounting? Do you know? Well, I, I was sitting in on May 11th and I'm wondering if um, the question related to that uh, came up at that meeting and, and if Diane's here, she can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that was the difference between the operating budget and then one that would be inclusive of um, capital and utility capital. Um, yeah, I have to go back and actually just look at the attachments that you were looking at, but I believe what we brought just last week was just the operating budget and didn't include the, the capital piece. Mm -hmm. Okay, so 300 is operating and capital? Yes, and the one that we did in December was consolidated for sure. And that would have been both as well, because in December it was 200 and change, and then when it came forward a couple weeks ago it was 300. So I was trying to figure out where the extra 100 came from, because I thought um, the other one was consolidated. Um, yeah, maybe I can dip, take the kind of take that offline and, and look back at the, uh, the attachments that you're referring to and I'll be able to explain it. Okay, that's fine. That was it. Thank you. All right, anything else? Okay, we have three readings of this bylaw. Does anyone want to put first on the board? Go ahead, Councillor Watkins. Okay, sorry here. Hang on. Getting to this motion uh, that bylaw 29 2020 being a bylaw to authorize the rates of property taxation for 2019 be read a first time. All right, I uh, accept that. Any opening comments? <laughs> no, I think it's all been said. Job well done. Okay. Anyone else want to add? Seeing none, I'm going to call for the vote. First reading. That is unanimous. Councillor Watkins, go ahead. The bylaw 29 2020 be read a second time. Excellent. I accept that motion. Call for the vote. That's unanimous. And then. Sorry, uh, to try to interrupt, Mayor. Is there a mistake in motion one? Should that not be the rates of tax for, nine, for 2020? Oh, you are absolutely right. We can, we can just, you know, by friendly amendments, just change it right now. But before we get further, I thought we should. Thank you for noticing that. I did not even see that. Okay. Well, we'll blame somebody later. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I'm seeing, everybody give me a thumbs up if they're okay with that friendly amendment. Okay. And the mover's friendly, so that's good. All right. Uh, Councillor McKay, I, th I saw your hand go up for uh, unanimous, unanimous consent. consent. Sure. Okay. That unanimous consent be given for consideration of third reading of bylaw 29-2020. Okay, call for the vote. Yes, consent has been given. Go ahead, Councillor Watkins. That bylaw 29-2020 be read a third and final time. Excellent. Call for the vote. Unanimous, all right. Quick question, uh, Mr. Scoble sent me a quick message asking if we could do the emergent item next because EOC staff is just waiting around and we might not want them to wait for these two more bylaws or sorry, one more bylaw and then the public hearing. Mr. LaFleur, if I just get general consent, can we amend the agenda to make that change? Yes, you certainly can. All right, can I see thumbs up? Everybody's okay? All right, Mr. Scoble, let's do the emergent item about playgrounds and uh, dog parks. Who's presenting you or is Percy coming in? Oh, there's Percy. You always, Percy, get to go home, we don't. <laughs> All right, you have any um, presentation for us? 
just a verbal presentation. We we're experiencing kind of a rapidly uh, evolving and changing environment, uh, and we were uh, submitted a, on behalf of the uh, emergency advisory committee uh, committee uh, a, a bunch of plans for reopening the the playgrounds based on uh, on not cleaning. New information uh, was received from the province that provides us with guidance on playgrounds and dog parks. Uh, the new, new uh, information allows for opening of playgrounds without uh, continued cleaning by the municipality. There's a lot of, with these new guidance documents, there's a uh, bonus on the individual in terms of individual action and precautions uh, and the precautions and actions for the municipalities. The biggest things for the municipalities uh, are providing, uh, providing signage that uh, identifies gathering restrictions and physical distancing. Uh, also uh, in, uh, in playground situations where we, where we have uh, water fountains, those are not allowed to uh, be, be operated at that, at those loca at that location. Uh, the, there's other, other kind, of, kind of considerations, but uh, the, the list is, uh, doesn't need to be read in this, in this forum. So this is a significant change from uh, what we were aware from the province before, and we wanted to make sure you had the opportunity to uh, uh, provide some guidance and direction for us. Uh, we are able to open uh, a number a number of playground structures based uh, based on this and uh, and the time frame here, uh, opening some of the city parks as early as 10 a.m. tomorrow, as uh, and uh, uh, changing the do off leash dog uh, parks, uh, unchaining the the gates. Uh, at 10 a.m. and in the case of the outdoor dog rinks uh, as early as noon tomorrow uh, and uh, then continue on with uh, opening up playgrounds and those would be kind of on uh, on a timeline of 30, 37 additional playground structures open for, for use by, uh, by 8 a.m. on May 23rd and then following that another two weeks to complete uh, the rest of the of the play play structures within within the city and that's uh, based on completing uh, a number of different uh, things that have to happen uh, the csa inspections of all the playgrounds the uh, uh, ground preparations and ensuring that uh, we've communicated with the uh, uh, the school boards of, uh, appropriately and uh, getting their their approval on their sites as well, and that's that's basically the information for you. Right. So um, I believe a motion was being crafted up for Councillor Jolly to read in. Do you have it, Councillor Jolly? I do. Yep. Did they send it to everyone or just you? Doesn't matter. Um, but okay. before we go to the motion, is there any questions? Go ahead, Councillor Hughes. Thank you. So, are we? I, when I I had we got an email about this. It's, I think it's good news. Um, the the Rotary Park and the Legion are they going to be able to open sooner than the twenty third, or is everything on playgrounds not open to the twenty third? Uh, we'll be able to open Lions Park and Rotary Park uh, for tomorrow. For tomorrow. Tomorrow morning. And yes. why can they open sooner than the 23rd? Uh, because some of the, the grounds cleaning and inspection was, was completed in advance uh, based on the information we had from the province. That's excellent. Um, also, are you going to be providing like an updated list on the website so people know which sites, which of the 37, for example, will be open on Friday and Saturday? And as you continue to get the other ones completed over the next two weeks, having it posted so people know when they can go there? We'll be providing that on the city's website. We'll also share that information with uh, with council so that uh, you can share that with the residents as well in your in your uh, uh, feeds and uh, social media. Sure. When when do you plan to share the list of the thirty seven? Because that's a lot of playgrounds, so people can certainly spread out with thirty seven. When do you plan to have that be able to share with the public? 
we'll we'll share them uh, as as soon as each playground's open, the play structure is open, and and that the uh, the parks them the themselves, uh, and there there are some of these parks that uh, have a number of uh, of play structures on them. Uh, but, uh, we there the citywide park are the Ro Lions and Rotary Park, which we can open to, uh, tomorrow, and then there's community parks ranging from. Uh, uh, kind of from Alpine through to through to Willoughby that have uh, have those structures, and it's we'll make sure that that's updated on a regular basis so that uh, those sites are are made aware of. Okay, so on the twenty third is when the list of the thirty seven will be coming out, or are we going to give people advance warning that those are the thirty seven for the twenty third? It's a lot of numbers. Well, so, so Councillor Hughes, we're going to be opening some of them before the 23rd. We have to go through each of them. So, you know, we're, okay. we'll, give us, we'll give notice the day before day up of which parks are opening. So we're not waiting to the 23rd to open all of them. It's just, you know, we have to, we can't do them all at once, all the preparation work. So we're going to work through and as okay. they're ready, we'll open them as we go, so to speak. Excellent. Okay. That was it. I think people will be happy to learn this information, especially ones with young children that are going stir crazy. Thank you. Any other questions? All right, Councillor Jolly, do you want to read the motion in? Oh, I think it's in the chat now. Yeah, I, I forwarded it to everyone as well. Okay. Um, so that the Rotary and Lions Park playgrounds be reopened for public use effective 10 a.m. on May 20th, 2020, subject to any applicable orders or guidelines for public use issued by the province of Alberta. That the gates on the off-leash dog parks be unchained and no longer locked in the open position effective 10 a.m. or at noon in the case of dog parks located in outdoor rinks on May 20, 2020, subject to any applicable orders or guidelines for public use issued by the province of Alberta, that upon successful completion of inspections and ground preparations up to 37 additional community playgrounds be reopened for public use with a target reopening time of 8 a.m. on May 23rd, 2020, subject to any applicable orders or guidelines for public use issued by the province of Alberta, and that within two weeks following May 23rd, 2020, all remaining playgrounds be reopened for public use subject to any applicable orders or guidelines for public use issued by the province of Alberta. Excellent. All right, I accept that motion. Any comments? Um, you know, just really quickly, this is something that could have been done by the uh, EAC, but I wanted to bring this um, sooner. We don't meet until Thursday, so I'd like to get this done a little bit sooner. We got information from the province this morning, um, you know, to everyone who's excited about parks uh, being open. Um, I think we all are excited, but it's still uh, important to kind of follow those guidelines about physical distancing, about hand washing. And uh, I know all of us parents out there, you know your kids best. Um, when my kids were little, they were the type that would probably lick playground equipment. So I, I probably would have made the choice not to bring my kids uh, to parks when they were in that stage. But, um, but I'm confident that parents know their kids best and know that their kids can follow those um, important guidelines. And uh, I'm sure everyone's looking to have uh, a few more options for, for getting outside. Anyone else? I just think this, um, the process that we approved last week, I guess it was, giving the EAC the power to make some decisions allows for these decisions to come to council on a Monday or EAC on a Thursday. And so we can get these things done as quickly as possible. Councillor Jolly's right. If, if we didn't have a council meeting today, I would have called an emergency meeting of the emergency advisory committee to get this done because it's really important. So. I know one resident who uh, can get, who can stop tweeting about it now. <laughs> All right, call for, or anything to close, Councillor Jolly? Okay, call for the vote. That is unanimous. And life slowly goes back to normal, step by step. Okay, thank you for sticking around, Percy. Go enjoy your evening. And we're going to move back to the Standing Committee Bylaws 8.3, uh, which is... Mr. Flyer, any presentation on this? Sorry, just uh, very quickly, this uh, these two bylaws, 27 2020 and 28 2020, arise directly from the motion that was brought originally by Councillor Broadhead that uh, the majority of council supported. And uh, apart from a couple of little minor clerical typo sort of things that we cleaned up, the main purpose of these bylaws and what they will do if passed 
is ensure that if the mayor shows up at either standing committee meeting, then the mayor must vote. It does not have the option to say, well, I'm just there as a sort of a non non member council member, the mayor either doesn't show up at all, or if the mayor shows up, the mayor shall vote. That's the purpose of the bylaws. That's what they do. All right. Why don't, is there any questions? Okay, I'm going to look to each chair. So, Councillor Mackay, do you want to do yours? And then I'll get Mr. or Councillor Watkins to do his. Sure. I'll put it on the floor. I'm not sure how I'm going to vote. Uh, that uh, bylaw 27 2020 being amendment one to the community living standing committee bylaw be read a first time. All right. Um, accept that motion. Do you have any comments? No, I think Mr. LaFleur explained the purpose of it. I still, the intent of it is my challenge. But uh, anyways, the purpose of uh, the bylaw change is I'm covered and that's my comment. All right, anyone else? Call for the vote. That's Councillor Broadhead, Hanson, Jolly and Watkins in favor. And I'm in favor too. And then count, opposed? Councillor Mackay and Councillor Hughes. All right, second reading. Uh, this is awkward. Uh, that bylaw 27 <laughs> 2020 be read a second time. Any more comments? <laughs> no. Call for the vote. In favor? Jolly, Broadhead, Hanson, Watkins, Heron. Opposed? Hughes and Mackay. Uh, unanimous consent? Jackie. <laughs> You are muted, Jackie. <laughs> um, I don't have that uh, page. So what page is it? <laughs> is it so just you know? Do you want to do it? Yeah. Okay, that unanimous consent be given for a third reading of bylaw 27-2020. All right, call for the vote. Oh. Mr. Hughes, are you opposed to unanimous consent? Okay, so that's unanimous in favor of unanimous consent. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Uh, all right, Councillor McKay. That uh, bylaw 27 2020 be read a third time. Thank you for that. Call for the vote. Jolly, Hanson, Broadhead, Watkins, Heron, those opposed, McKay, and Hughes. All right. Thank you for that. Councillor Watkins, do you want to make the motions for your committee? Uh, that bylaw 28 2020 being amendment. One to the Community Growth and Infrastructure Standing Committee bylaw be read a first time. Thank you for that. Any comments? No, it's all been said. Yeah. Anyone else? Call for the vote. That is Hanson, Broadhead, Jolly, Heron, and Watkins in favor. Those opposed? Hughes and Mackay. All right. Second reading. Bylaw 28 2020 be read a second time. Thank you for that. Call for the vote. Jolly, Broadhead, Hanson, Watkins, Heron in favor, opposed? Hughes and Mackay. Um, Councilor Broadhead, unanimous consent again? The unanimous consent be given for the third reading of bylaw 28 slash 2020. Uh, call for the vote. That is unanimous. We can go into third reading. That bylaw 28 2020 be read a third time. Call for the vote. I got Jolly, Broadhead, Hanson, Watkins, Heron in favor and opposed is Councillor Hughes and Councillor McCoy. All right, we have six minutes of the public he hearing so I don't wanna move on and start anything new. So I will call a six minute recess and we'll be back in our chairs at five.
I see I just sent you a text. I didn't get anything, Ken. All right, it's five o'clock. Adrian's there. Okay, I've got, I just need Councillor Watkins to come back. Let's see, there he is. Okay. Just warming up my coffee. <laughs> okay. We're just going to do some of the preliminaries. I don't have my um, cheat sheet, which I normally have when I'm doing a public uh, hearing. So hold on, everyone. All right. So it's public hearing on 18, 2020. Uh, so three L, just the Lenny's file. Okay, we're ready. Calling this public hearing to order. I know we have some registered speakers. I've got uh, Rachel Vincent, do I see there? Stephen Yu, do I see Stephen? I'm here, I just don't have a camera. You just don't have a camera, but you're there. Okay, good to know. Um, I got Scott Mackey and Paul Lenny, I think are the proponents. And then of course, Faye Wood, is Faye here? Maybe she'll be joining us in a minute. I'll come back and Harvey Wolf, I see on the screen. All right. So, uh, Mr. Schultz, you're going to do a um, administrative presentation on this. And then I will allow members of council to ask questions. And uh, then we will go to the proponent and then ask questions. And then I'll go to the public. So, welcome, everyone. Uh, this is the first probably really big public hearing we've done in this manner. So please be patient with me. And uh, Mr. Lafar, if you need me to um, do something that I have forgotten, please just let me know through the chat. All right, Mr. Schultz, go ahead. Okay, good evening. Let me see if I have to show my screen here. Hang on. Uh... Share. Here we are. No. Oh, God. Panic. We're good. <laughs> Adrian, do you have it that you could share? I'm just looking. Okay. There we go. It, oh, it showed up for two seconds and then disappeared. Eric too, is he still there? We lost him and his speed. Oh, there I'm he back. Is. You're back. <laughs> okay. We we saw this the the presentation for a split second and then you both disappeared. So whatever you did, do part of that right again. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh. There you go. Is that it? That's it. <laughs> Sorry for the challenge. I'm working off of just a phone instead of a webcam, so it's a little more challenging. Oh, okay. I'll have to make sure we 
get you the right equipment next time. <laughs> yes, they're really hard to get a webcam in these times. Everybody seems to want one. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I have a spare one in my office you can have. Oh, okay, go well, ahead. Okay, so uh, good evening, Mayor, Council members, and members of the public. Um, my name is Eric Schultz, and I'm here from Planning and Development to present Bylaw 18 2020. Uh, this is a, uh, a redistricting in the South Rail neighborhood, which is located in the southwest of St. Albert, as shown on the map. Bylaw 18 2020 is an amendment to the land use bylaw Schedule A. Schedule A graphically identifies each parcel of land in the city and its current land use district. When there's a change to a district in Schedule A, a redistricting occurs. This is a new application that proposes to redistrict approximately 10 hectares in South Riel, as shown on this map. The lands subject to this amendment are currently districted as medium density residential or public park. Approximately 9.3 hectares of the area will be redistricted to the new Midtown District, leaving approximately 0.7 hectares as park space. Uh, the purpose of this redistricting application is to bring the subject lands into compliance with the approved area structure plan for South Riel, as they do not currently comply. There was a previous application made to redistrict these lands last year. There were actually three applications uh, last year. Um, the first three bylaws that went before council last year on April 23rd. The first bylaw created a new district called Midtown in our land use bylaw. This is for the development of a comprehensively planned neighborhood that includes a mixture of commercial and medium to high density residential land uses. The second bylaw amended the South Rail Area Structure Plan to redesignate the subject lands to use the new Midtown District. The third bylaw was to redistrict approximately 19 hectares of the South Rail neighborhood, shown on the map to the, on the screen there. Uh, however, there were a number of residents that raised concerns about the potential height of the buildings during the public comment of the 2019 redistricting. The developer is proposing building heights of up to 30 meters and residents were concerned that the buildings of these heights would result in a loss of sunlight, a loss of privacy and increased traffic due to higher densities that the buildings would bring. In response to these concerns, Council amended Bylaw 16 2019 during second reading, removing approximately 10 hectares as shown on this map here. The applicant came back with a new redistricting application and as part of the application, they hired RWDI to conduct a sun shadow study on the lands um, to the east of the uh, subject area that's in the neighborhood of Heritage Lakes. The study was prepared based on building heights of 30 meters, which is what was being proposed. The report back from RWDI indicated only one of the 12 simulations created shadowing on the Heritage Lakes residential neighborhood to the south. Um, you can see the four plots on the screen here for 3 p.m. on four different days of the year, and only one on the uh, very right for December 21 shows shadowing on the buildings at 3 p.m. The applicant has also stated that resident concerns will be further considered during the design and development permit phase. Uh, during the circulation of the new redistricting application, residents raised concerns that the original study did not include evening plots. The RWDI study provided plots for uh, 9 a.m., noon, and 3 p.m. The city contracted O2 Planning and Design to conduct a complementary sun shadow study uh, earlier this year. The purpose of this second study was to obtain additional information in response to these residents' concerns. The O2 planning design study provided hourly plots from 8 a.m. until sunset. For the times that matched the RWDI study at 9 a.m., noon, and 3 p.m., the uh, shadow plots matched uh, perfectly. We can see on the slide here, I showed the March 21st, 3 p.m., and the shadows from both studies are the same. The O2 evening plots did show shadow footprints onto the Heritage Lake residences to the east of South Riel. Um, on this slide here, that would be the blue shadows. Um, the O2 study, however, also showed that these shadows were largely negated if 21, max, 21 meter maximum height was used. That's the pink plots. So at 8 p.m. on June 21st, the shadows you can see aren't quite reaching the uh, houses on to the east there. In conclusion, the proposed redistricting application is supported by the Area Structure Plan, the Municipal Development Plan, and the Land Use Bylaw. 
Therefore, administration recommends approval of the proposed um, land use bylaw schedule A amendment as presented today. And that's it. All right. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Schultz. Uh, maybe unshare your screen for now. I don't think we need it. We might ask you to bring up some you bet. pictures later with specific questions. So okay. I'm going to go to council. Is there any questions for Mr. Schultz, Mr. Scoble, Mr. Slot, any of the staff? Okay, I'm seeing Councillor Hansen and Councillor Hughes. Go ahead. Uh, thank you. Um, the only question I have, and I'm sorry if I missed this, um, in terms of 30 meters and 21 meters, what's the difference in stories? Uh, that would be three stories. And 30 meters is uh, oh, a max a maximum height? That was the height proposed by the applicant for what they okay. want to do in that site. And how many stories is that? Uh, 10? Ten, and so the difference is the difference is ten to seven stories on, uh, on the shadow study. Right, three less anyway, for sure. Three less. Okay, thank you. That's all. Okay, Councillor Hughes. Thank you. So, the recommendation is still to have thir um, thirty meters, in spite of the fact that the shadows do have pretty significant impact after four p.m. Is that right? That is correct. The land use file of Midtown District allows for those heights, and so there's no uh, land use bylaw reason why we would recommend against those. Because of the previous bylaw. Because um, I, I mean, I'm looking on page 187 of our second package, I don't know what that is in the total agenda package, 583 at 7 p.m. And I'm looking at three full cul de sacs completely in shadowed. Part of the ne next street and half of the other across the road is also directly affected. And I'm thinking that even at six o'clock, all those three cul de sacs would also be affected. And so when I see the shadowing stays up at 3 p.m., it's very misleading because it looks like there's nothing. And then as of four o'clock, it starts to become much stronger with the shadows. And so, like, this is coming forward being recommended to come forward, recognizing that if we have the 30 stories, or three, 30 meters as being re recommended, that there's going to be a significant shadowing effect on quite a few people. Like we're talking three cul-de-sacs plus some presence here. I just, I don't understand why this is being recommended and not being acknowledged to the degree that people are gonna have their sun setting hours and hours before it would be normally. Like the sun setting people on the cul-de-sac by 6 p.m. it looks like. On March 21st. So why would we be recommending this and not acknowledging the severity of the shadowing after 3 p.m.? The, the land use bylaw Midtown District allows for heights of a maximum of 35 meters. So there's really no reason for administration to say that you can't do something that's been approved in the land use bylaw. So that's all we can do at this point is, is the application meets the requirements of the land use bylaw. Therefore, that's what we're recommending. Yeah, I don't think we have anything within our policies that says if we have what, what we're comparing the shadow against, right? We don't know nothing in our policy that says if this shadow exists, that it's not approved or it's not. I think, Christina, you want to jump that's, in? That's cool. Christina? Yeah, I wanted to um, just um, add a little bit to Eric's comment. Um, last year, the area structure plan was approved, um, Council, and with that, it gave pretty strong direction to the um, appropriate land use district, which was approved. Um, however, the rezoning was not approved for the southern portion. And the rezoning, um, when looking at re reviewing the Council um, meeting, there were concerns about the sun shadow. So when we went back and looked at it, we actually requested that the applicant do basically the maximum extent that they could have to demonstrate the impact. Um, at this stage, we do not know if the applicant is gonna come in with a 30 meter application or a 21 meter application or a 15 meter application. Um, and I think Adrian's got a few more um, pieces of information for you. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to say to your point, uh, Mayor Heron, um, there there are no metrics about what a shadow 
impact study actually means. It's qualitative information for council to consider in this case um, and uh, for us to consider, but there is no there is no sort of regulation that says if a shadow exceeds X, then Y or anything like that. It's, it's qualitative information for us to help evaluate the impact of the development. So let's just say the council says, you know what, this shadow is too expensive and affects too many people for too long of a period. Because the Midtown ASP has been approved for this height, what is our potential? What can we do about it? Let's say council says no to this and says we don't want to go up to this height because they may be 15, but they're allowed to go up to 30 if this is approved. So, hoping for something different is not exactly reasonable because they're being allowed to do this. So, we have to recognize that we're agreeing to the worst case scenario of height as far as shadowing if it's in pass. So, but we're being told that because the previous ASP was approved, that basically this height is non negotiable. We have to go back and redesign the other two to be able to lower it. Is that what I'm hearing? Well, to be clear, Councillor Hughes, so administration does not have the, the purview of that sort of decision making. They they have to follow the land use bylaws that's outlined. I mean, the final decision is ultimately that of council, but that it that would not be the prerogative of administration to recommend something counter to a bylaw. No, but what I'm trying to figure out is if we were to say no to this and say you couldn't go to 30 meters, because the previous one's been approved at 30 meters. What would be the steps to then make the two lines meet? Because the recommendation, from what I understand, is to say yes because the 30 meters was approved or 35 meters was approved in the previous midtown approval. Christina, you want to jump in? Yeah, I can uh, just direct council to the alternative motions that have been provided. Um, there is an opportunity because this is council's decision and council's prior. Uh, prerogative and their bylaw that they can actually request amendments. Um, I would suggest if if this um, is not approved, you would actually want to send us back to make amendments to the area structure plan and then corresponding the land use bylaw as well. So if you take a quick look at the alternative recommendations, it, it's aligned mm -hmm. there. Yeah, it's exactly yeah. the answer to cancer question. We can't tell, like the developer after the ASP has been approved, it has no onus to have to change the ASP. Like even if we say no to this, the proponent does not have to come back and ask for an ASP change that matches some other height, right? I mean, they could just say, okay, we're just gonna leave it. It's, it belongs to the city, not their proponent, Councilor Hughes, so it would be up to okay. us. Motion. Okay, um, and do we, are we aware of any other developments that have been approved before that have this kind of shadowing effect? In, in late afternoon? Because I'm thinking like the Grandin Towers, it was shadowing onto non-residential in, in the later evening, for example. It wasn't shadowing directly over Grandin residents. So I'm, I'm trying to think of another area that we approved that would have had this kind of shadowing. Uh, to, your, to, your, to your question, uh, Councillor Hughes, that, that was the example that I was gonna say, we did do shadow studies for the uh, Amacon Towers. Right. And Amicon did not have it hitting the residential for shadowing. <laughs> Shadows went towards the river and away from the I think the there, there was some limited uh, yeah. impact on the residences there, but. Yeah. Was it to this degree? I, I'd have to go back and look a little bit more closely. Okay. On that one. And I just want to confirm I know it said in the background that we did we actually send out uh, letters to everybody who was affected with 100 meters? Although the shadowing goes past 100 meters, it looks like, but um, 100 meters out, was everybody sent a letter to being notified about this public hearing? Yes, when we circulated uh, for this one, everybody who was in 100 meters or who had previously uh, sent a letter at the public or spoken to a previous public hearing got notified. When were they notified? Uh, this application went somewhere late December, right? I think we mailed them out. December 22nd. So they don't know that nobody here knows that there's a public hearing today, though. They were sent something out six months ago, but nobody was notified about today's public hearing. Today's public hearing was sent out um, two or three weeks ago, whenever we normally send, whenever Ledge Services normally sends out that they sent them out. Yes, yeah, so I, I can confirm we followed our usual practice, and the, 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 this, this public hearing absolutely was advertised and, and people notified. 
So they were sent letters then. I'm just surprised that nobody, there's have so few people who commented the first time would come back and not comment the second time um, on this. That, that's, um, yeah. Any more questions, Councillor Hughes? That's it for now. Councillor Watkins. Yeah, I have a question and it's just about the sun impact. Is the worst impact of the sun on December 21st at 3 p.m.? Is that the one we're looking at that shows the longest shadows? For, for the original RWDI study, yes. they did plots for uh, 9, noon, and 3 p.m. So that only the December one showed shadowing at 3 p.m. Okay, when so we, at 9 a.m., the, the houses cast a, cast a shadow on the multi-site. Is that not true? Is that how it shows? How it reads on page 143? Yes. And then at noon, there is really no shadow. No. Nope. Cast. And then at three o'clock, 1500 hours, that's when the large shadow gets cast, right? Correct. In, on December 21st. Yes. And what time does it get dark on December 21st? About four o'clock. So they're in shadow for about an hour before it's dark? Yes. Okay, thank you. Those are my, that's my question. Okay, so that's a good point, Councillor Watkins. So December 21st at night, it's already dark out. Dark at four o'clock. Yeah, okay. I had a quick question about the sun shadow study. I think I mentioned it to you when we did um, first reading. I, I, I don't know why we did a peer review of the sun shadow study. That, that confused me. We asked the proponent to spend money on this. He does it. And were we just not satisfied with it? Uh, I can speak to that, Mayor Heron. So again, um, the information provided to us by the applicant was, um, it was nine until three, nine in the morning until 3 p.m. Um, we wanted to undertake some additional information because council had indicated during last year's hearing, um, one of their main concerns or questions was about the extent of the shadowing on the residences adjacent. Okay. And so we undertook additional uh, technical study, just like we would with the TIA, so that we have additional information to be able to tell council, this is the impact that's happening. Um, it, was tried, it was done to try to complement what was done by the applicant. Okay. So the thing I liked about the, the, the sun shadow study that um, Averton submitted is it showed the existing shadows the peer review does not show existing shadows because the trees there are 20 meters high. So do we have any idea? Um, probably not, I guess, about it, it's the net difference that I'm interested in if, with the building there or not, right? So do, we don't have any idea what the net difference between existing shadows from the trees and the surrounding areas as opposed to what would happen after, I'm seeing Christina shake her head. Okay, because if you look at, at the first one, the existing shadows are pretty large as well. Yeah, that is correct. We're, um, we were very specific on um, responding back to some of the requests that our um, residents had raised. Um, okay. That was the reason for us to relook at the, at the, to do a little comparative analysis. Okay. Um, looking for more questions of our staff right now, Councillor Hughes. Yes, um, Councillor Watkins mentioned the worst shadowing that's happening. The worst shadowing that the pr proponent provided was on page 143, but if you go to page 187 of our agenda package, you're going to see what the larger uh, shadowing is, for example, March, um, as of like 4, 5, and 6 p.m. and 7 p.m., and it will be even more dramatic having that difference if we had it, for example, in June, which wasn't provided. So the largest shadowing effects I'm not seeing are happening at three o'clock. They're happening it towards the summer and spring, summer, fall, and in later hours, which is not being provided by the proponent. So I just want to make sure that's clear. So please feel free to go to the pages like 186 to 188 of our package in the second portion there to see what the real shadowing effect is, because I personally found it to be misleading to stop at three o'clock when the shadowing that the residents were concerned about was happening after that time. Okay. Um, yeah, that was it. Councilor McCarr. 
So reading the ASP, <clears throat> the approval of this ASP doesn't constitute approval of any servicing agreement, future district uh, subdivision development agreement, development permit or building permit. So if um, the proponent comes forward with a plan uh, to, uh, with a, a site, a development permit, and it um, is the maximum 30 meters. Um, so does that, that's gotta be approved by um, administrate, well, it's gotta go to administration or can it be appealed to the subdivision and appeal board? You're that's talking the development permit? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, in reality, um, going forward, if um, if the proponent brings forward the maximum allowed under the land use bylaw, um, can that be appealed? Mr. LaFleur, I'm going to go to you for that. You're muted. My bad, sorry. You can hear me now? Sorry about that. It's, it's so annoying to have to constantly unmute because if you don't, feedback so so anyway uh yes <clears throat> what would happen is that there'd be a development permit application and then the decision on that could be appealed by anyone who's agreed uh the problem is though uh, and this is where i don't know one of the planners could probably say whether uh, the development applied for would be a permitted use or a discretionary use if it would be a permitted use then the sdab has very little scope to do anything with it they could vary some conditions perhaps, but they couldn't, uh, they couldn't overturn the decision on a permitted use because our development officer, if it's permitted, they have to grant the permit. So maybe, you know- I think Adrian just unmuted. So is it permitted? Yeah, so I, I guess just to speak to that, whatever would be a permitted use in that zone, um, if, if somebody wanted to appeal that, they could only appeal based on, uh, I guess, it, whether administration properly interpreted the land use bylaw, but if it's if a building comes in at 30 meters and we approve a permitted building at 30 meters, and that's what the land use bylaw says, then there's very limited opportunity for them to appeal that. Yeah. If it was a discretionary use, they could, but on these buildings, if they're permitted, then uh, they cannot. Okay. So going further into the some of the other details that are in the uh, ASP done by administration. So there was a 207 geotechnical investigation that uh, suggested that anything over four stories would have to have a uh, um, further site specific location. And so, I mean, what, how would that influence um, a decision or would it actually just mean that the proponent would have to get additional uh, geotechnical uh, investigation information? Basically they'd have to come in with a geotechnical so to say that the site could support a say a 30 meter building but long as that was you know done again I don't think that's grounds for appeal unless the geotechnical said that it wasn't and at that point we probably wouldn't approve it right but so um, and then Eric or Adrian you you would work um, with the proponent <clears throat> or whoever brings forward a uh, pr proposal for site C around because it says further on uh, around the, the building massing and form of development in the area to uh, configure to mitigate impacts on the adjacent heritage lakes or residential neighborhood. How does that accomplish? Do you just um, work with a proponent around what this site would look like, how it would mitigate some of the concerns of the residents if approved? Uh, yeah, Councillor Mackay, uh, to answer that question, so typically our development officers work with an applicant to try to find the best site plan um, that that does mitigate concerns, and and they could, at that point, I guess it 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 would depend on how willing the applicant is to work with the uh, development officer to determine what the outcome of the um, permit application would be. Yeah, so I mean, there would be a lot of give and take working with a proponent around trying to uh, also impact what's going on in the uh, neighborhood or how, what the impact of their structures would have potentially. <clears throat> that could include location on site, am I correct? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's always a little bit difficult again. So if it's an approved, um, if there's an approved height, it, it really depends on how willing a, a developer is to work with us. 
as to uh, what kind of concessions we get or what kind of agreements we get because um, some people, uh, some developers may feel that council has already approved a certain, uh, certain height and a certain use and they don't want uh, the development branch or the planning branch to be fettering with their design. So it, it all kind yeah. of depends. Yeah, no, I understand. I'm, I'm just trying to say that there is some give and take here. Um, <clears throat> what, so when they did the placement of the buildings on the, on the site to conduct the shadow studies, though those are just conceptual diagrams at this particular time, the, the, and therefore based on that conceptual, conceptual diagrams, that's how they do the sunset studies, correct? I mean, they didn't move the buildings around to see what the implications would be? Uh, that's, that's correct. To my understanding, it, it represents basically the most impactful um, design that could happen to the adjacent residences. So yeah, so I mean, you didn't take a series of, let's say if we moved a couple of the buildings that were oriented north and south, that would obviously cast the biggest shadow onto the neighborhood. You didn't have anybody didn't kind of tweak the buildings just to see what the uh, less impact would be on the sun study. I think the only tweak that uh, that occurred was um, just in the heights to see what the impact of those different heights would have been. But if you would have orientated them east-west, they would have a significant impact on the shadow study. Yeah, there is some site plan concern considerations that would impact shadows, yes. Yeah, so I'm just saying, again, something to work with. There is a gas line that runs north and south along the railway uh, PUL in that. So, I mean, was that built factored into the into the placement of the buildings? The, or, or the, the sun shadow? The, the gap between Heritage Lakes and South Rail includes the railway, the utility court, all that. It's approximately 45 to 50 meters that nothing can be built in, including all the setbacks, yes. So 45 meters to Heritage Lakes or 45 meters just to the railway or are both the PUL on both sides of the track? I think it's basically the closest a building could be to Heritage Lakes to basically the back fence of those things was about 45 meters. And so another few meters. meters for the yard. So 50 so, meters between <clears throat> building and building. So, I mean, again, transitioning where the buildings are placed could have a significant impact on- Absolutely. And wind and sun. Okay. All right, thank you. Okay, I think I saw Councillor Broadhead's hand go up. Go ahead. Thank you, Madam Mayor. <clears throat> so I recall a couple of developments that had uh, shadow studies. Uh, Botanica for sure had a shadow study, but the one that comes to mind as well, uh, I'm hoping I don't get the name wrong, Rosedale when they uh, uh, proposed their uh, addition. How, how tall is that particular development? Ooh, that's good. Uh, eight, nine stories? I don't think it's quite that tall. I've, I want to say it's six or seven. Rosedale. It's, it's a, the first phase that faces the residents are six, and the one that faces the mall is, is, no, the one that faces the residents is four. The one that faces Hebert and goes with the mall is six. And they didn't have serious shadowing happening on those because it's six and they do have an extra street before it even gets to them. But the ones that were four, they do get shadowed. That first line of houses, they do get shadowed quite a bit from the four on, a, on Arlington. My but it's four and six. Uh, how many, could, uh, like, have, you, have you received a lot of complaints about that uh, around the shadow studies? I mean, you know, so we're looking at a shadow study that, that captures a moment in time on a particular day as the maximum. Uh, and yet the sun moves. And so, so that I would recognize that shadow has impact, um, but, but nonetheless, it's, 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 it's not constant. My, my point is that, that the shadow is not there 24 seven. It, it in fact moves around and the shadows change. So have you had any concerns or any complaints from people that live around or across uh, this, you know, the street from Rosedale. You directing that to Adrian? Yeah, I, I'll, I'd have to check with the development branch on that one, Councilor Broadhead. Okay. Yeah, just be interesting to know because every time there's sort of a larger structure, uh, we have three basic concerns. 
you know, loss of property value around that con uh, the construction site, increased uh, traffic and, uh, you know, shadows. I'll send an email now and see if I can update you in a, a couple of minutes. Okay, well, that'd be, that would be great. Thank you. All right, I'm looking to council to put up their hand if they have any more questions. Okay, um, I'm seeing none from council. Don't worry, you know, we have lots of time to come back to staff if we have more questions. I'm gonna to go to the proponent now. So Mr. Lanny, do you or if any of your people have a presentation or are you just here for um, questions? I have a presentation. Who's, who's speaking? Uh, Steven, sorry. <laughs> Hi, Steven. Okay. I can share uh, my screen. Yeah. yeah. Okay, can everybody see that okay? I can, go ahead. Perfect. Uh, good evening, Madam Mayor and members of council. My name is Stephen Yu and I'm here with Scott Mackey and Paul Laney to present bylaw 18-2020. Today we will be providing a background on the project, discussing the application and providing a summary of it. The Self-Real ASP was amended and adopted by council on April 23rd, 2019 which split the residential components into areas A, B, and C. The subject lands that we are discussing today are area C and a small portion of area B. The Midtown District was also adopted by council on April 23rd, 2019. Council approved their redistricting for lands north of the Alta Link, while the lands south of the Alta Link remained in their current state to provide additional time to review the planning rationale. Uh, the intent behind bylaw 182020 is to redistrict the land south of the Alta Lane. Currently, the, in the land use bylaw, the image on the right, uh, does not align with the approved self real ASP image on the left. Uh, that was approved by council last year. This application would bring the land use bylaw in alignment with the statutory document. In addition to this application, additional studies were completed, such as the Sun Shadow Study and the Wind Impact Statement, both completed by RWDI Consulting. To provide a little bit of context, the subject area to be redistricted is the area identified in red. To uh, the right of these lands, in the green and the black, is the existing trees and the rail line, and to the right of that is the existing residential identified in the yellow. The sun shadow study illustrates the shadow patterns for the worst case scenario. This means if the buildings were located as far east as possible and at the maximum height as for the lane's bylaw. Note, um, I, as we were discussing earlier, the maximum height, the, under the Midtown District, the maximum height is only 25 meters with additional height going up to 30 meters if certain urban design criteria are met. However, it should be noted that the buildings are unlikely to be developed in such fashion that was shown in the sun shadow study as it would be impractical due to the configuration and other restrictions and objectives that I'll get to later. As per the study that was completed by RWDI, 12 shadow plots were prepared for various points during the year. The preparation of the sun shadow study did also have limitations as the study was prepared based on the worst case scenario and not what will ultimately be built as these details have not been finalized yet. Of the 12 plots completed by RWDI, one plot identified potential impacts on December 21st, which is, as mentioned, the shortest day of the year. This plot was for 3 p.m., where a typical sunset in Empton is around 4 p.m., as was already discussed. Um, it is important to note that RWDI acknowledged that the existing trees were not taken into consideration as part of their analysis as per industry standards, but the trees on either side of the rail may act to reduce perception of shadowing. Um, so looking at the uh, visual impact, this figure shows the location of the buildings in the shadow study and a more plausible location of the building that follows the ASP objectives. In the self real ASP, it states that mixed-use buildings should cluster around green spaces, which are located more centrally on the site and away from the eastern parking line in the rail. Um, as the shadow study was done at the worst case scenario of the lane's bylaw, it also did not consider the additional setbacks required from the pipeline right away and the rail line pushing development even further to the west away from the property line. Finally, the trees shown in this figure uh, attached um, are not to scale, as many of the trees are taller or as tall as the existing residential development, acting as an additional privacy measure. Now I'm gonna throw it over to Scott to summarize the rest of the presentation. Scott. 
Scott. You need to unmute yourself, Scott. I, so I, I've been involved in sun and shadow issues in both Edmonton and Calgary. The parameters that were used for the RWI study uh, are typical for these types of settings. Uh, the general premise is that uh, during the main parts of the day, um, the sun uh, pro, um, trying to maintain, minimize that shadow impact is, is the goal. Uh, towards the beginnings and the ends of the day, um, shadows, there's a little more tolerance for sun shadows in those jurisdictions. Um, as Stephen said, the uh, redistricting aligns with the ASP. It does meet the objective uh, of the plan. I will, I want to reinforce, however, that the sun shadow study, the parameters that we uh, worked on in conjunction with your administration were very extreme. If you look at the size and the shapes of those buildings and how they're pressed up uh, against the rail right of way, um, the, the buildings are a very inefficient design. They're very narrow rectangles, which uh, aren't practical, but as well, the separation distance from that uh, rail uh, and from the pipeline weren't respected. And so they would be further away than that worst case scenario. So in the worst case scenario that you've seen in terms of the, sh the shadow, um, it's uh, certainly not something that uh, anyone would expect to be developed. Stephen, can you advance to... Uh, so this is an image looking from um, the Midtown site uh, towards the, the residential properties. You can see how tall the trees are. Uh, so this is from ground level. What I've done though is I've gone into um, uh, Google Earth to provide a perspective view. So here you can see where the trees are. The thick, there's thick bands of trees on both sides of the tracks. You can see that the trees for the most part are, are as tall if not taller than a lot of the residential properties. Next slide please Stephen. Here you can see, uh, this is a, a close-up view uh, from that, um, um, that uh, 30 meter height, giving you an idea along some sections of the, um, the residential properties there, um, the trees are already much taller, if you will, and will cast a, a shadow earlier in the afternoon than the buildings would. And so any impact the building ha it ha would have would be negligible. Next slide, please. So this, this one is actually, if you look at the bottom right-hand corner of your screen, you can see this is based on a, um, a 35 meter height from about where that building footprint could exist. You can see that that's the angle that you would see from the top of that building. Next slide. This is another um, one a little further up. So you can see that while you can see some of the houses that for the most part, those, those buildings are masked by those trees. So from a privacy and a sun shadow standpoint, it's the trees that are, uh, uh, are gonna mitigate um, any of the issues, but they're providing shadowing or, or creating shadows um, that are going to start sooner in the afternoon than the, than the building would. Next slide, Stephen. So this is another one. You can see that the properties up in this end to sort of towards the, the north, there are some properties that are not obstructed by the trees, but for the most part, most of those buildings um, have a, a very dense um, forest of trees that are going to uh, protect them. But again, those trees are providing shadows uh, much earlier than the building would. Next slide, Stephen. So just the general um, provision because of the height of the trees, the trees for the most part again are taller than those um, than most of those homes. Uh, based on that separation distance of uh, where that building would be, the closest it would likely be, and the distance between the trees and those properties, the bigger impact uh, in terms of sun shadow is going to be the trees. And uh, while there are some gaps in some of those trees, I'm not saying that the building won't cause any shadow on any of the properties. The gaps, there's only a couple of significant gaps. And for the most part, the trees are providing much broader, much longer shadows than what you would see with those buildings. And that's the, uh, the end of my presentation. All right, thank you all. Um, I will now open it up to council to see if you have any questions of um, the proponent. Go ahead, Councillor Mackay, and then okay. Councillor. <clears throat> I'll be, I'll be really quick. I just want to make sure that this is just confirmation is kind of maybe where my line of questioning was going is. is so when the, the shadow study that was done by uh, both the proponent and um, the follow-up one done by administration, it did the worst case scenario, buildings on the furthest east height uh, oriented north and south. Is that correct? That's, That's correct. correct. 
So, I mean, and that's not, and so the presentation that you just gave us was, is that you move the buildings 80 meters or how far away from um, where the conceptual, where the sun study was done to where you would potentially put a building on that site? Uh, the buildings were located in the sun, sun saddle about three meters from the property line. So yeah. we are looking at about at least 45 meters from the property line. And if you're looking from the property line of the existing residentials, we're looking at about 95 meters. So you'd be 95 meters from the property line? Of the ad adjacent residential property, yes. Okay. All right. So, I mean, it's, I guess it just fell into some of the questioning and kind of, I mean, I, you always do the worst case scenario. I, I agree. But I mean, in reality, it's where it's going to be. So your buildings and how they are orientated on that site um, would be um, not where the um, sun study was performed. Yes, that is correct. The intent is to locate the buildings closer to the green spaces, such as directed by the uh, South Real ASP. Okay, thank you. All right, I have Councillor Hughes and Councillor Broadhead. Thank you. So your study that you stopped at three o'clock, um, but the city did a one that went further on, pages 184 or whatever, 582 in the agenda package and so on. And it doesn't just affect the first level of houses behind the trees. So I'm, I'd like to have your comments on the level, the second and third and fourth houses and the ones across the street. I mean, that, there's no trees that are going to make them think that they're, they're in a tree shadow. When I look at the effects of what's going to happen, even in March, let alone June, as the sun starts to set, let's say six o'clock or seven o'clock at night in March. Um, your explanation for the shadowing only goes to 6 p.m. or just goes to the first row. So how would you possibly explain how all the other houses for the next 100 meters in Crossing Churchill would also not be affected or concerned about the shadowing? So the shadowing isn't going to reach those houses as early. It reaches them later, of course. By then, what you're also seeing is some of those houses, once that sun starts getting down to that low level, the houses are actually creating, starting to create shadows on each other or, or on each other's yards. So right. while I mean, the building is going to have an impact on some houses, but for the most part, not as significant as things like trees and other buildings that are closer. I'm looking at this one here on page 582, and there's no way that that could be confused about having a house beside you with a shadowing. I mean, these, these shadows go quite far back and it's almost a complete blanket of a, a solar eclipse here. So I don't, I don't see how you could tell me that the shadow of my house next door is going to be anywhere close to the shadow of what's gonna be happening from these 12 stories. Okay, but instead so, of it being three hour, a three hour period where that shadow is gradually creeping across those residential properties, that shadow that you showed is happening right at the end of the day. So that's the last hour of the day. It's also happening at six o'clock and it's happening that's the last hours in December. It's the last three to four hours in March, and I'm suspecting the last six in June. So it's not one hour we're discussing here of having them have a shortened sunset. It's six hours probably in June. And I'm so I'm just trying to make sense of this because you're trying to minimize the shadowing effect, but it's quite substantial. It just wasn't recorded in your studies. Did you actually go past 3 p.m. to see what the shadowing effects would be, or did you look at what happened when the city reported their shadowing effects? So again, appreciate the building is 80, about 80 meters f f uh, likely further away from all of those buildings than the trees would be. So when, when you look at the, uh, the length of the shadow and the, and the length the distance of that they impact, as you move further away, mm -hmm. your shadow uh, is um, being mitigated, if you will, by things that are close, closer by. So do you have the, the effect of where it would actually be in your studies at 6 p.m., for example, on March 22nd? Because I'm being told that it's going to be a far different, but those shadows extend pretty far. No, um, I'm, I, I, I'm I'm saying that the shadow study is correct. That that's how if the if the building was there, and there were no trees or no other buildings, no other houses, that's how long the shadow would be. But what I am saying is that once the sun starts getting that low, we appreciate that uh, that shorter and shorter uh, objects that are closer to those dwellings are casting a shadow that is just as long. <laughs> Okay, I, I would love to see that actually in the in the display because it cuts off at 3 p.m. to actually show that that would be the case because what I'm seeing does not reflect what you're saying. And when I look at like 8 a.m. and how long those shadows are, those shadows are going to be just as long on the other end when it's setting. And they are they go all the way past Riel and you go past Anthony Hendy, in fact, at 8 a.m. 
um, on March 22nd. So there isn't a, there isn't anything that could talk to me and tell me this is going to be the same as having a house shadow beside me. I mean, I have it just it's just not possible. But I really wish that your studies had actually put them where you say you're going to be and then show what the actual shadows would be past 3 p.m. Because the only time we actually see the effect is that one hour in December. We don't see the effect the rest of the year. And the time effect of one hour in December is the minimal time effect as opposed to in the summer, which would be a maximum time effect. So, but you don't have it. So were you, uh, were you asked to do the worst case scenario shadow study? Yes. There we go. So yeah. what, and so let's say 8 p.m. on June 21st, okay. that if would I, not be as bad. So if I can share this image with you. Okay. So again, if you take a look at this figure, Mm -hmm. So you see that um, you can see once the sun reaches this point, it doesn't matter how long the shadow is this building is provided. This building here and this tree here, their shadows are going to get longer and longer as well. And so they're mitigating that impact. Not for the guys across the street who don't have a house beside them to cause that shadowing. I'm not oh. talking about the first row of houses. I'm talking about the third, the fourth, the fifth, and the ones right across the street behind the cul-de-sac that are also being affected. Yes, and what I'm saying is towards the end of the, t of the uh, day when the sun is out, they're starting to get impacted, but they're not getting impacted for that full three hour period. They're starting to get impacted later and later in the day, right before sunset. Not according to this, it's still gonna be two to three hours prior to sunset. And that's even in March. I'd be no, curious to see what it's- the sun gets lower again, this, this building here is gonna start impacting the houses across the street from it. It's going to, so that, that shadow is going to go across the street and in someone else's yard. Cause I mean, I'm beside houses and I can tell you that doesn't happen. So I'm not going to have anywhere near the effect of having a high rise beside me or down a block or whatever. So, but you didn't provide that information. You stopped at three o'clock. So I'm disappointed because you're trying no, to tell me to move it back 80, 80 meters, but then you don't show us the effect of 80 meters. So this blue box here is going to cast a shadow on the house across the street, but that may be 30 meters away, it's going to cast a shadow on that because the mm -hmm. as the sun starts going down further, that shot the house shadow gets longer and longer as well. Okay, we're just going to have to agree to disagree on this one. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Broadhead. Did anybody do a sun shadow study before the buildings? Like, I mean, do we, do we know what the sun shadows are currently? Like, That's I mean, what I was asking the net. Shadows might be across the street already because there's buildings and there's trees there now. Does anybody have an understanding of where the shadows are today at the extremes? There's no formal technical analysis that was done of the existing case, no. Okay, fair enough. Doesn't, doesn't uh, my other question is who owns the trees? So, and the reason why I'm asking the question is that somebody's not going to come along and, and uh, in the course of construction, rip them down, are they? I, are they on the rail right away, or where do those trees exist? So the, the taller oh, okay. oh, go ahead. are actually on the side of the of the track adjacent to those residential properties, not on the side of the tracks of towers. So they're they're the ones that are providing the the greatest level of of privacy as well as um, the greatest shadows. Are they CN trees, city trees, or uh, private residence trees? It's a combination of CN trees and whoever owns the TUL that's adjacent to the adjacent uh, residential properties. Okay, fair enough. All right, I saw Councillor Watkins uh, stick his finger up. Yeah, just on the, uh, on the December 21st uh, sun shadow simulation at 3 p.m., you're saying that the existing, you're showing the existing shadows from the houses covering the houses across the street. Is that what that shows? Yes, it does. Okay. And, and so you're saying that that's where you're saying that on that day, the houses on the west side of the street are going to cast a shadow on the houses on the east side of the street at that time anyways, even if there isn't a tower. Exactly. And appreciate while well, that's happening at 4 p.m. on uh, December 21st, that exact shadow, that exact same situation is happening at uh, 9 p.m. in June. 
Okay. Okay, thank you. I think going forward, we should ask for those uh, net comparisons in shadows because that that was what I found very helpful. Um, I'm looking around for council members. Any more questions of the proponent? Go ahead, Councillor Hanson. I, I have one quick question and, uh, and it might be hard a hard one to answer today. Um, well, actually it's, it's two parts. I guess for this area C, when are these buildings like realistically, if this gets approved, when would they be going up? And realistically, um, it's it's market dependent whether or not you would actually build to 30 meters. I guess I'd just like a comment on those things. I'm gonna maybe Mr. Lanny, do you wanna answer that one? Or Mackie, I don't know. Who. Some staging um, ideas and market. Um. Sorry, I'll, yeah, I'll jump in just quickly. I mean, we we have plans to uh, to move forward with our seniors residents in the next uh, ideally 24 months. Um, beyond that, certainly it'll be driven by market demand and, and such. As far as the designs of the buildings themselves, I can promise you that we will never attach our name to a block like what was contemplated in uh, in the studies. Uh, but again, in the interest of worst case, that's what we've that's what we've done. So. Um, there's a there's no crystal ball certainly in these days to know how things will proceed, but our 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 intention is to still work forward on the the senior side of things. That help, Councillor Hanson? Uh, yes, it does. Appreciate that. Thank you. Okay. All right. Uh, before I go to the public, Councillor, do you have any more questions of either the proponent or or our administration? All right, I'm going to the public and I will go, I think this is the order of people that signed up. Uh, Rachel Vincent was on our agenda, so she signed up quite early. So she will be going first and then I will have Faye Hood and then Harvey Wolf. All right, so Rachel, you're more than familiar with the process. Go ahead. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Uh, my name is Rachel Vincent and I've been a resident of St. Albert for 42 years and I am opposed to bylaw 18 2020. While I realize that this bylaw is simply the final piece in the legislative puzzle that is the Midtown development in South Riel, I have serious concerns regarding the impact of the proposal on the residents of Hawthorne Crescent just across the CN tracks. While residents continue to voice concerns regarding privacy, traffic, noise, reduced property values and proposed densities double that of other residential neighborhoods in St. Albert, it's the issue of shadowing I wish to focus on today. <laughs> anyway, I prepared this, so I'm just going to plow on. As council is aware, the original shadow study from RWDI on behalf of the applicant provided 12 scenarios for 9 a.m., 12 noon, and 3 p.m. on four dates, 21st day of March, of June, September, and December, and based on the maximum allowable height of 35 meters. Let's think about this for a moment. Here in St. Albert on June the 21st, the sun doesn't set until 10.07 p.m. and twilight lingers until past 11. The last reading for June 21st in the shadow study is 3 p.m., barely an hour and a half after solar noon when the sun appears at its highest point in the sky, virtually directly overhead. It's an insult to council's intelligence and to that of the citizens of St. Albert for the applicant to think that this incomplete and misleading information is acceptable. And compounding the admission, in Vistec's November the 19th letter to affected property owners further seeks to mislead by stating that, and I quote, the proposed redistricting will have minimal impacts on adjacent properties. 
Only one of the 12 simulations creates shadowing on the Heritage Lakes residential neighborhood. The RWDI shadow study also states, the dense rows of trees on either side of the rail line may act to reduce the perception of this shadowing, depending on the species of trees. Anyone who's walked in that area will know these trees are not dense spruce trees, more like skinny birch and brush, despite the impression provided by the persuasive photographs shown by Mr. Mackey. I was encouraged when I was told earlier this year that city administration was also unhappy with the information provided by Invistec and was planning to commission a third party shadow study. I naively assumed the city would be requesting a summer evening shadow study, providing late afternoon and evening readings, in addition to the 9 a.m., 12 noon and 3 p.m. scenarios originally provided. However, when bylaw 1820 came to council for first reading, I was flabbergasted to discover that the new shadow study commissioned by the city from O2 Planning and Design provided absolutely no additional and key information on the summer situation and simply checked and added to the data originally provided for March the 21st. How could it possibly be okay in our northern latitudes to think that a shadow be meaningful? On March 21st, the backyards of Hawthorne Crescent Indeed, of all Canadians living in the prairies are still covered in snow. It's only in the summer that we can actually enjoy our backyards as extensions of our homes. Even O2 had the grace to say, and I quote, it is generally considered that the warmer days are important for shadow considerations. At the April 20th council meeting, Mayor Heron requested information on the cost of the O2 report. It would also be interesting to see the terms of reference provided to O2, because to me, the resulting study was a complete waste of money and does absolutely nothing to further inform the discussion. In fact, it looks like a ploy to bamboozle the public and push through an unpopular development which can only damage the quality of life of so many St. Albert residents. Oh God, I'm a fucking vomit. Excuse me? Councillor Watkins, you need to mute your mic. Council, as residents of St. Albert yourselves, please consider for a moment that this development does not respect the intent of the original South Riel ASP. Consider the option provided in the final paragraph of administration's agenda report. Defeat the bylaw and direct administration to bring forward amendments to the South Riel ASP and the Midtown District of the Land Use Bylaw to reduce the development impacts on the residents of Heritage Lakes West. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Vincent. Um, apologize for that interruption in the middle. Um, any questions, Councillor Mackay? I, I too, Rachel, I apologize too uh, for that interruption. Um, goodness, it's great to hear your voice again. <laughs> you have such a great voice. I wish you would read. Uh, I mean, it's nice to hear your voice. Um, uh, you're just on mute, Rachel. Um, the, um, you, you listened to the proponents uh, and they talked about where that's uh, both the studies you referred to and the buildings where they were oriented on the um, 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 application, where, where they were on lot C, or C, sorry, I apologize. <clears throat> um, what do you think about their response about moving it more towards the center and further away so that the shadows uh, will, will, will not have uh, any impact or less impact into the residents of Heritage Lakes? Developers change over time. Uh, they get tired of uh, waiting to develop properties. They sell the land, uh, they move on. My comments were based on 
the worst possible scenarios, given that if this bylaw is passed, what could be um, done on that property? Okay, fair enough. Um, I appreciate it again. Thank you very much for your presentation. Go ahead, Councillor Hansen. Hi, Rachel. I see you. Um, and yeah, and I also do apologize. Um, can we, I guess, you know about developers and you know about progress and you know about economic um, stimulus and, and all of that. If there is a, um, a height to these these particular buildings and, and and we do have to acknowledge that they're not necessarily going to be um they're not going to be necessarily built in this conceptual plan the way that they're laid out is there a height max that you could live with i guess is my question i haven't really considered that to uh, councillor hansen okay thank you any more um, questions? Go ahead, Councillor Hughes. Hi, Rachel. I'm wondering, how did you learn about the public hearing? Was it in the paper or how did you learn about it? It or is in the newspaper, but my son lives on Hawthorne Crescent, so he's uh, very much impacted by this. And uh, like many um, <laughs> normal people, he, uh, uh, they don't always understand planning speak. So uh, I took a great interest in this because of my, my son is an owner of a uh, property in Hawthorne. Thank you. That's it. All right, seeing no more questions, I'm going to move on to uh, Mrs. Baywood. Sorry, before you go, Mrs. Wood, I see Councillor Jolly's hand popped up again. Go ahead. Well, I mean, this is very belated, um, but I think a, a point of order um, and kind of a request for an apology is appropriate. Um, I, I, decorum in these meetings um, is, is something that we've committed to. I know where you're coming from, Councillor Jolly. I, 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 apologize. I apologize for my comments. Uh, it wasn't really in relation to those speaks, and I was supposed to be muted, so it wasn't meant to be heard by anyone else except myself. And I wasn't commenting on Rachel's particular comments. Thank you for clarifying. Thank you, Councillor Watkins. All right. All right, Faye, go ahead. Thank you. I hope I don't get the same response. My name is Faye Hood. I've been a resident of St. Albert for 43 years. Um, I would like to address a little more than the shadowing with this development. I am a resident of Heritage Lakes. I am not uh, directly impacted by the shadowing. However, I am impacted by the development in general. I have a big concern about the density of this development. Based on what I've read before, um, it was to be 80 units per hectare, but apparently this final C part is gonna be 186 units per hectare. Um, as uh, my understanding is that St. Albert has 30 units per hectare in the most dense part. I think this produces um, some other concerns. As soon as you put in that many units, you are going to have narrower roads. My understanding is there are no sidewalks and no boulevards planned for this community, which will reduce the greenery, of course, and which will reduce the opportunity for people to be walking in that area. The narrower roads are a concern. Um, if you look around St. Albert, you know what people drive here and you know what people have um, as far as vehicles, it's unrealistic to expect that that is not going to happen there. Yeah, we may use buses, but the reality is it's not going to happen. I am very concerned about the number of people in that area, and I'm very concerned about uh, congestion as well, which was mentioned briefly. Coming out of St. Albert at rush hour, if you go on uh, Ray Gibbon or coming back, you'll wait two or three lights now. If you add 700 or so vehicles, you're going to wait a lot more lights. I know Ray Gibbon is to be um, in large the access to it is not at this point so we're going to see that 
Um, as far as the shadowing, I know that uh, the Oakmont people were able to form a group and come forward and talk about what they were concerned there. You are addressing this at a time when we are not able to come forward. I have spoken to a number of neighbors, which, and I'd hope that they would get involved. Um, I think they will be sending some emails, et cetera, but we can't even get together to talk and to, to say, what do you feel about it? What's happening here? I think it's important that we acknowledge that a large part of um, Heritage Lakes has not been able to speak up at this time, I did speak up earlier and other people that I know did as well. This is um, seems a little bit like we're being pushed forward at a point where we can't bring a group forward to discuss this. St. Albert is called the uh, Botanical Arts City for a reason. We are always on the top 10 list of um, where people want to live. We want to keep that, that philosophy, that belief that greenery, all of the expectations, I suggest strongly that these, um, that the large, large apartment buildings are not allowed. There's uh, no problem with apartments, but let's be reasonable. The shadowing is one part of the problem. The overpopulation of the area is another. And I really hope that you will consider not just um, what we're putting in there. I looked at the seniors residence, I'm a senior, and I'm thinking, oh, geez, that's not bad, that's close. I would not live there. I want a place where I can walk. I don't want to have to drive away to find a place to live in my green part of the world. So please, I hope that you consider all of these things before this decision is made um, and, and perhaps listen to a few more St. Albert um, residents. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, any questions? Is it Mrs. or Miss Hood? It's Mrs. Hood. So for H, I want to be correct. Any questions of Mrs. Hood? Seeing none, I'm going to go to Mr. Wolf. You need to unmute yourself. It's okay. Can someone from IT unmute uh, Mr. Wolf? Sorry, I'm just trying to find him in the list. That's okay. All oh. right, you're good, yeah. <laughs> All right, Mayor and Council, thank you for your time. Thank you for allowing me to uh, to address and uh, speak to you on this matter. Um, I spoke uh, to you uh, the first time this issue came up and um, would like to thank you for addressing a number of the concerns we brought forward at that time. Um, I would just like to speak to uh, a few things that have come up previously before I go into some of my additional points. Um, uh, someone had asked how, how we were hearing about this, uh, today's hearing. Um, I got the letter in the mail, which is what triggered my, um, my signing up for this. Um, but I would also like to uh, echo the previous speaker's comments that um, when I, I spoke to a number of my neighbors on this, um, that I know attended the first hearing in person. And um, I would suggest that the hearing format is something that is um, probably reduced the number of, um, uh, reduce the participation overall in this. I would suggest that if this hearing were being held during normal times, um, you would probably have a much larger audience in the gallery. Um, uh, another point I would like to add on to uh, was, uh, I believe it was Mr. Mackey who had the, um, used, uh, I think it was Google Earth to kind of take some perspective shots of, of what the backyards on Hawthorne Crescent might see for privacy. But I would just like to point out that almost none of those trees are evergreen. So during uh, late fall, winter and spring, um, that's completely see-through. There's, uh, there, there's very little to, to stop uh, or to enhance privacy there. So um, I, I, I don't truly feel that leaning on, on the existing band of trees is a valid argument for privacy. I don't feel that's been addressed. Um, another point I would like to bring up is the, uh, the shadows. Um, I didn't put anything together. It's nothing uh, scientific. I used a very simple angle meter and the information from the shadow study. Um, 
what I came up with standing on my standing in my backyard is on March 21st, I would lose about two hours of daylight. I would be in shadow approximately two hours sooner. Um, if that building were there today, um, based on today's uh, sunset chart, I, I feel I would be uh, in shade approximately three hours sooner. Again, it's not scientific. This was just me with a simple angle meter taking the height of a 30 meter building 45 meters away from my property line. Um, and it's the property line issue that uh, I want to speak to next. Um, I believe it was Mr. Lanny who mentioned it is their intent to be approximately 95 meters back. However, uh, I would just like to voice my concern that there is no assurances of that for the residents. Um, intent is all well and good, but if I just mentioned to you that I intend to pay my property taxes, you would probably still enact legislation to make sure that I do. And I would just like to see the same standard applied here. Um, uh, the first time this bylaw came up, I believe there was also some speak of um, restaurants or retail on the main floor of these buildings. Uh, I don't feel the current setback is ideal for that. Uh, restaurants are required to have large uh, ventilation fans uh, over their range hoods, especially if they're deep frying something. Um, since I can only assume that these restaurants would be uh, facing west, the discharge would be facing east directly at our backyards. Um, if I'm off on that, I apologize. Uh, and and my, my final point, um, again, it, it's been mentioned before, but I do want to bring it up again, and that's, that's the density. Uh, this is a completely self-imposed density. I don't feel uh, that it really necessarily fits the, the greater vision of what uh, Council has um, set out to do. I do appreciate Council's task with trying to diversify the housing uh, options available in St. Albert. But given the price point of these, uh, these units, which I believe at the first meeting were set to be probably north of 300,000, um, I don't feel that these developments um, are, are enough of a departure to, to, to justify such a um, dense development. Um, I've gone over my time, so I'll stop there. Um, thank you very much for listening. Thank you. I actually didn't know you'd gone over your time. So thank you for self-regulating. <laughs> All right. Any questions for Mr. Wolf? I'll get, just give a quick one. If you could get the assurance of the 95 meters, would that make you somewhat more comfortable? Yes, yes, absolutely. It would. Um, uh, like, like I said, the first time I addressed council, um, we always knew there would be development back there. And on some Levels, it would be great to have some shops that close, you know, coffee shops and so on and so forth. But um, it's it's the height of it and just how close it is. I believe the current bylaw um, has a park, uh, a very thin sliver of park right along that right of way. Um, I would love to see that maintained. It would just give the residents some assurance that um, what the developer intends to do is actually what's followed through on. Well, we do have an opportunity to go back to the proponent to ask that. Um, any other questions from council to Mr. Uh, Wolf? All right, seeing none. Before we take entertain any motions to close the public hearing, is there any questions of council? Oh, Christina, do you have your hand up? Um, I do. I do believe that Eric has um, an email that got submitted uh, today as just as a point of the public record, if that would be okay to, for yeah, him to have to get him to read it because we, we don't yeah. have it. Can you it go ahead? Very long. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> it's from Oris Mike Mikan, and it reads, please do not approve the third phase of the Averton development at the absurd level of 80 units per hectare density, as that would forever cause an enclave of congestion and poverty stigma to those who would live there. A higher density can be achieved with a more reasonable target of 50 to 60 units per hectare there and elsewhere in Saint, future St. Albert developments. So just didn't like the 80, he wants 50 or 60. Okay, thank you for reading that in and we'll make sure that is somehow 
publicly part of the package. Right. All right, council, it's your turn now. Any questions of administration? Go ahead, Councilor Broadhead, and then Councilor Hansen. So um, walk me through the development process uh, that uh, the, the proponent comes with a uh, proposal, ask for development permit, what sort of architectural uh, design uh, authority does the city have? Does it have the authority to say setbacks of X? Uh, can we do those sorts of things to give some sort of assurance to the residents? Uh, uh, to your question, Councilor Broadhead. So again, whatever is listed in the bylaw is what the development officers have as their authority there those, those are the parameters within which development happens so if the height says uh, 35 meters or if the building setback is 10 meters whatever those numbers are that those are the parameters within which development officers typically um, work within they do have some some flexibility some power to um, i guess try to mitigate some development aspects but those are limited so it essentially is whatever council enables is what you can expect to be developed. So just as a follow on, uh, I appreciate uh, Mr. Lanny's uh, intended, uh, he stated earlier, but if we were to pass this, then they could, under the bylaw, we could actually have a 30 meter tall building, uh, which is like a barrier, long and skinny all along the uh, property line. Is that correct? Uh, essentially, that's correct. It, it, yes, I mean, that's the short answer, yes. Okay. We don't have any architectural authority over, uh, you know, uh, that sort of thing. How do we determine what gets built in the city then, I, I guess is my question. Yeah, so the, so the development officers are able to uh, um, stipulate some conditions on their development permits at times to mitigate impacts. Um, we do know that um, a, a number of those times, if it's more of a judgment call, those can be brought to the SDAB, the Subdivision Development Appeal Board. And um, essentially the Subdivision Development Appeal Board looks at whether the, uh, the property is uh, in, you know, impacting others and if, if the, uh, the use of the land by that owner is being impacted uh, adversely. So, and generally they uphold the application, um, the applicant's design, demands or desires. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. Uh, there's, there's a yin and yang though too, on, a on the proponent side, he's got to build something that is sellable at the end right. of the day. So I appreciate that. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Any other questions for administration? Councillor Hansen? Just uh, thank you, Mary. Can you just remind me again what our obligations are in terms of density? Uh, according to the Edmonton Metropolitan Region Growth Plan, it is 40 units per hectare. Is that right? I think I should know that one. Yeah, Eric's given me a yes. <laughs> this would be a 40. Thank you. Christina? Just a point of clarification, however, in the area structure plan that was approved last year, this area has an overall de minimum, uh, overall density of 80 dwelling units per hectare. And for this portion on the south side, um, it's much higher. Um, I don't know exact, uh, I should ha I have it right here, but it's uh, around 150 dwelling units per residential hectare. The range yeah. is one. The range is 120 to 250 in area C. Thank you. So, I mean, there's there's our own area structure plan that we approved, Councillor Hansen, and then there's the, the growth plan. So those two guiding documents. Any questions for the proponents before we go ahead, Councillor Hughes? Oh, no, sorry. Okay, do you have- I, have, I had it for admin, actually. Yeah, go ahead, yeah, I'll go. Um, is, why is it higher in area C? 
Is it because area B and area A were lower density and so area C is to compensate for that? So the overall is still 80? That is correct. Okay, so if area C was not approved, the proponent could revise area A and B, increase the density there and make it more even distribution, right? Yes, there would have to be some changes um, to the area structure plan as per the alternative recommendation, which should occur, yeah. Okay, so we're, we're in this box because of A and B was approved and so now we have to make up the density in area C and that's why the density is so high, right? That is correct. Okay, thank you. All right, I just one. I have guess I'm going to ask one question to Mr. Lanny. Um, one of the one of the presentations from the public was looking for reassurances. I know that's something we can't really hold you to, but there's there was a question about some park space um, near the rail lines. Is it the intention to maintain that park space? Um, the short answer is we have we have setbacks that are mandated by CN and uh, uh, ATCO, I guess, that we have to be 30 meters uh, away from the rail at a minimum. So there will be a corridor there of undeveloped area, but I would not call it park space. Or what we've done is we've pulled the municipal reserve in previous ASPs um, and shifted it over to uh, other park for uh, just a better site design. And um, in terms of the assurances there, I mean, our, our, our preference uh, has always been in our, uh, the best outcome for a community of this nature is to have density uh, surrounding the commercial uses so that there's density to support commercial. Um, time and time again, we see uh, examples in the region where mixed use is not successful because it doesn't have the, the appropriate density to support it. So we wanna make sure that any commercial uses are successful. Um, so we would like to make sure that we do have that density to support any commercial uses that do arrive on the site. Um, in terms of proximity uh, or, or, or distance from the east boundary, uh, again, our, we, we want to, you know, one of our, uh, one of our game plans is to uh, amenitize um, with density around open space. As much as possible, so our our amenities are are not along the rail. Um, so we would try to orient our, our density uh, in clusters around the, the green spaces or open spaces. But it's going to vary depending on the fabric of what ultimately gets developed. All right. Okay. Any more questions, Council? All right. Seeing none, um, I'm going to entertain a motion to close the public hearing. Councilor Broadhead, go ahead. Okay, move that the public hearing on bylaw 18 slash 2020 be closed. Thank you for that. Um, any comments? Anyone on the council wanna weigh in? All right, calling for the vote. So that's Broadhead, that is, sorry, Councillor Hughes, is he, okay, that's unanimous. All right, okay, is anyone wanting to put, um, second reading, sorry. <laughs> and I think we need to point out that there was an error in the map. We all got me emailed it today. So second, sorry, Mr. LaFleur, are we, are we reading second reading as amended? Yes, that's correct. All right, so if anyone's wanting to put the motion on the floor, we can do that. Councillor Jolly's got her hand up, go ahead. So that bylaw 18, 2020 being amendment 178 to the land use bylaw schedule A be read a second time as amended. Is that what we're looking for? Yeah, yeah. that's perfect, yeah. Just to fix that one little map. Uh, all right, go ahead with your opening comments. Um. This, uh, what this motion is going to do is align our, our land use bylaw with um, the already approved ASP. 
Um, it's also hitting a couple of points on our strategic plan. So looking at both uh, enhancing the housing options that we have in St. Albert um, and strengthening our, our economic, um, you know, investment. Um, Mr. Lani, you you hit the, the nail on the head when you said that commercial needs density to support um, healthy businesses. Um, and that's what we're looking here, looking at here. Um, certainly change is, um, is scary and seeing this new type of development is scary um, and we we saw that with uh, shops in Boudreaux and, and we're seeing it with this um, but I'm excited about your project and I, I look forward to to seeing um, what we'll be able to build there thank you thank you Councillor Broadhead thank you Madam Mayor um, change uh, is difficult at the best of times and uh, and change of significance to a community that we love is also difficult. But communities evolve over time. And, uh, and sometimes you, you need to step out and, uh, and, and make a choice. And you gotta make a decision. And I, I believe too that uh, the long-term uh, benefit to the city of St. Albert is here. I recognize that there are concerns around privacy. I recognize that there's concerns around shadow studies, but I'm, I'm in a single family dwelling. I'm on the second floor, I look out and all around me are trees. My neighbor's house is six meters from mine and uh, it wipes out my back deck from about four o'clock in the afternoon for most of the summer. And it's just the nature of how things go. I cannot, uh, I, you know, I don't own the sky, I guess. You know, I enjoy the community in which I live and I adapt to how it plays. And uh, so my neighbors across this, uh, my back fence have a direct view into my, uh, into my deck and they're 20 meters away. So, it is a matter of, of the nature of living in community that sometimes we have to a, live in community. And so there's, there are impacts no matter which way we look at it. Um, I recognize that uh, the worst case scenario, uh, this sort of barrier wall up against the uh, um, rail line that is used for the shadow studies, that's, that's a daunting look. Uh, but uh, I, I'm convinced that that would be unsellable if that were to be built and, and uh, the proponent is not in the business of building unsellable uh, product. Uh, he too, or the developer uh, proponent is also has an interest in maintaining the community in which he invests his hard earned money. And I believe that the, that the build form that's coming as a result of Midtown will not only uh, introduce to St. Albert a new and unique build form for, for single, uh, single family, multifamily, but in the uh, development that's before us today, we'll start to introduce uh, badly needed seniors housing as well. So um, I recognize that there are impacts and, uh, but nonetheless, I'm going to support this. Thank you, Councillor Broadhead. Uh, any other members of council wanting to speak? Councillor Hanson and Councillor Hughes. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm going to echo uh, a lot of what Councillor Broadhead and Jolly have said. And I, uh, development and progress is hard, but that is how cities grow. Uh, we are asked to consider uh, more density. We have to support commercial. And I guess, you know, all of us live in developments that were at one point in time controversial um, and we've had to build. And I'm sure that when houses started to get closer and closer together, that was very hard as well. But this is, this is part of a growing city. Um, and I think that the built form as Councillor Broadhead has said is is going to be new and diverse and attractive to many people. Um, and 
you know, I think that uh, the de developer is here listening to what what the difficulties, the perceived difficulties are. And, and I'm sure that something that is going to be built is going to be uh, sellable. And, uh, you know, without a doubt, every new development has its impacts. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we stop developing and we don't progress. And so uh, I am going to be supporting this. Thank you. Thank you, Hughes. Thank you. Um, I'm very concerned with how much shadowing the impacts are. We're being told that it's going to be set back further, but we don't know what the actual impacts are. It's more like a trust me, it'll be fine without actually any evidence to show that that's going to be the case. Um, and we're looking at potentials of having the sun set on many houses hours earlier. It's blocking out the sun for full cul-de-sacs right across the street. If it were worst case scenario, it goes right across Sir Winston Churchill and into the next neighborhoods. This is not a minor impact that we're discussing as far as how fast that they're gonna be put into darkness prematurely as a result of this development. And even if you moved it back a few more meters, even 10 or 20 or 30, you're still gonna impact it because some of the worst case scenarios went right across Sir Winston Churchill. So, um, I, I didn't appreciate how the shadow days ended at 3 p.m. when the reality is that the impacts were going to be much greater in the other se other seasons um, and later into the day. As far as seniors housing goes, we can accomplish seniors housing in four stories and six stories. You don't have to go up to 12 to be able to say you've also contributed to additional seniors housing. And I mean, ultimately, I feel that we had um, concerns about Riverside and changes to that neighborhood just a few weeks ago. And it was the concern, well, residents didn't ask for this. And so how can we make these changes? Um, residents knew there'd be a development here. They never had an idea that it would have this kind of an impact on their, their lives. And so the same arguments keep played there. And we're about to have another public hearing on June 22nd, where people are gonna come and say they don't think that high rises belong next to residential. And those are 12 and some are 26, but if they were 12, would you now say that it was okay in Oakmont if you, if you were having concerns at that time? So the impact to other neighborhoods seems to be weighing in heavier than the impacts to this neighborhood. And we're disqualifying the impacts that the building of that size is gonna have on quite a few people because of the, the sun sets on that neighborhood. So I, I can't feel comfortable approving something and saying that we're moving forward because of progress or any other types of key statements. It's, if we're building something, it should be for minimal impact to the neighborhood, to recognize the people who've already invested in our community and not disqualify their concerns. Especially when the city did shadowing studies that show that the shadowing could be significant. And I personally would not want to be in darkness three or four hours earlier in the summer. Um, you know, it's not a minor issue, it's a major issue affecting quite a few houses, hundreds of houses, it looks like to me, if it were to follow the worst case scenario. And even if it wasn't the worst case, it is still going to affect many, many people uh, and their homes and their lives. So I think that this could be accomplished differently. And uh, without having to go up to 12 stories, this could be accomplished by going back and actually looking to see whether or not Midtown in of itself actually needs to be the way it was designed. And ultimately, if Midtown was redesigned, it would be to accommodate cars that are larger than a Corolla so that people could have them purchase cars and have friends and relatives that have cars to come visit them by their residence, which currently doesn't even exist. So this is not something that I would foresee. I realize I'm probably the only person against it, but it's still not something that I could support. That's it, thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wanna speak? Right, Councilor Jolly to close. Nothing further. Call for the vote. All in favor. So I've got Hanson, Jolly, Watkins, Mackay, Broadhead, and Heron, and opposed. Councilor Hughes. All right. Um, we don't need unanimous consent. So third reading. Uh, that bylaw 18 2020 being amendment 178 to the land use bylaw schedule a be read a third time all right anything further it's all been said anyone else 
All right, accept that motion, call for the vote. I see Jolly, Hanson, Mackay, Watkins, Broadhead, Heron, and opposed, Councillor Hughes. All right, that take, is there anything else on this matter, Mr. Scoble? Uh, no, there's not. All right, it is 6.39. Is everyone okay if we continue on to the transportation system bylaw? It's a public hearing as well. Okay. All right. Um, one sec. You've got a presentation, Mr. Schick? Uh, no, through you, Mayor, Madam Mayor, there's no formal presentation. Um, I can give just maybe a bit of uh, brief background and then uh, hopefully be, uh, let, let council go forward with debate. All right. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, thank you, council members, for having me here this evening. Um, just for a, a background um, and a clarification, what we're in, is in front of council this, after, this evening is uh, the transportation systems bylaw which is essentially a document formalizing and documenting the existing and planned road network. Uh, so it's not to be confused with the traffic bylaw, which captures regulations and whatnot. Um, this, is, this is not the traffic bylaw that's in front of council for consideration of amendments. Uh, previously, administration was in front of council uh, and approvals uh, were, were uh, made to the amendments that are essentially back in front of council right now with the single update um, being being based on the Alberta Transportation's um, ministerial review uh, to have Reagan and Drive identified in the bylaw as a future or planned freeway. And so previous amendments, all previously approved, were all aligned to um, the essentially alignment to here we go. Thank you very much. Actually, can you just hold on, Mr. Schick, one uh, second? You can sit here for five Hello. hours and nothing. Hello. And then the moment. Yeah, just hold on for one sec. Um, I didn't actually officially open the public hearing. Oh, so right. if I had a gavel, boom, public hearing is now open. Continue. <laughs> All right. So, uh, as, as per documented, or sorry, okay, no, no, girls. Oh. I need, I need to let mom we, wants um, to know something, Dad. Just take it two seconds, Dean. Go figure it out. <laughs> I've been there. <laughs> <laughs> Did you see the one when some lady was getting interviewed on the news and these two cats were having like this power fight right behind their head? Sorry. Don't shake your head, Mr. Goble. We're just, we're winging it. Go ahead. Yeah, <laughs> My apologies. No uh, good. So as, as noted, what's in front of council this, this evening is essentially all previously approved amendments to the transportation systems bylaw with a single new update of identifying Ray Gibbon Drive as a planned freeway. Uh, that was actually based on feedback and is in front of council based on a ministerial request from Alberta Transportation. Right. That, that's all. Thank you. Yeah, it should be pretty straightforward. All right. Uh, any questions of Mr. Schick or anyone else on administration? Seeing none. Uh, there's no proponent for this one. Um, Cheryl, did we have any registered public members wanting to speak to this? No, we didn't. Okay. Councillor Mackay, go ahead. I'll just move it if you're ready to go. Okay. Oh, you, I'll just move that, that that we close the statute the here public hearing. All right. I'm just making sure there's I've exhausted all questions. Yep. yep. No one else has anything. Go ahead and make the motion. Oh, Councillor Hughes. Hi, Dean. You got you got your hair cut. Did you cut it yourself? Like you just That's say it. actually it is. It's this is uh out of laziness and uh probably boredom. This sure. is what happened. All right, it, looks, it, it yeah. looks good, dude. It looks good. Um, I say so, aerodynamic, but I'm no faster. So okay. Well, oh, no. anyway, um, topic. <laughs> so beyond that, um, so the planning for the freeway. I thought we we're 20. It we were still not class. We we're classifying it as a highway or something different. So why are we changing it to plan on freeway? Uh, so essentially, what it is is what we're building it to is an arterial four lane divided roadway. However, the right of way and the future plans will still exist and be supported to transition the roadway as needed in the future to a freeway status. So it could be up to an eight lane freeway with interchanges. Uh, and so this is a positive in regards to the city for acknowledging what the potential future demand on the roadway would be. 
But in terms of what we're delivering this year or the 10 year plan of improvements, it's only a four lane arterial. So we're just keeping our doors open so that if when the opportunity arises, it's not wiped out of the picture, is that right? That's correct. Right, okay, that's it, thanks. Right, okay, Councillor Mackay, can you make the motion to close the public hearing? Yeah, unless one of Dean's girls wants to. <laughs> um, that, the <laughs> that the statutory public hearing on bylaw 19 2020 be closed. All right. Uh, anything on that? No, I think it's all been all the background as to why we're doing this and has been uh, uh, outlined. Thanks. All those in favor? That looks like it's unanimous. All right. You still have your mic unmuted, Councillor Mackay, so I'm going to look to you to make. The motions. Fine. Uh, that bylaw 19 2020 be read a second time. All right. Any comments? No, I don't think there's a need for it. It's been covered in the presentation. Okay. Anyone else? Okay. All those in favor? That's unanimous. Third reading, please. That bylaw 19 2020 be read a third and final time so Dean can go for supper. <laughs> All right. All those in favor? That's unanimous. Okay. Um, we did the emergent items. Uh, the council updates were all on um, consent. I'm not going to read them all out. <laughs> so I'm going to actually just, I'll take Councillor Jolly's. Well, let's finish up with the council motions, um, the information requests, et cetera. And then we can take a quick break while we switch over to the team's meeting. Um, so go ahead, Councillor uh, Jolly, and make your, uh, just read your motion into the record. Bear with me, I'm just at our last motion right here. I have to scroll down. Page 244. Uh, I don't use the same oh. thing. Sorry, I apologize. You get there though. Um, did we skip over the financial report? Or oh, that was on consent? Yeah. No, Diane gave it, didn't she? No, that was the, the, the COVID scenarios. This is Q1. Yeah. Um, it's right after that. Okay, here we go. I've got it. So the recommended proposed motion that the free all aboard program for low income residents be extended to local handy bus service for a trial period of one year. At the end of the one year period, the trial should be assessed based on items such as cost to the municipality, members, etc. Furthermore, that up to $30,870 be funded from the stabilization fund to support this initiative. All right. Okay. Before I accept that, any questions? Councilor McKay. Sorry, I apologize. I was trying to unmute. I'm just wondering uh, on a friendly or something like that, uh, Councillor Jolly, in the sense that um, just recognizing the pandemic and the situation we're in with the recovery task force, is there any wording that we can do to, 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 to I don't know. I mean, it, the timing's wrong and I'm just trying to work with you to, I mean, I love the, I love the intent. I'm just trying to see if there's something where we can maybe um, move it recognizing the current situation we're in. So are you asking to defer? No, I'm not asking to defer it. If I did that, then that would be a moot point then. But I'm just, I wanna support you, but I wanna also see if there's something that we can build in as a friendly that would actually um, allow this to be um, moved so that we can recognize some of the impacts we're dealing with with the financials and the COVID and things like that, so. I'm, I'm seeking some sure. advice, maybe. Yeah, I'm not sure exactly what you're asking. You're asking. Well, I'm, I'm just seeing if there's an opportunity, and maybe I, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I tried to come up with wording myself in relation to what I, so I could actually uh, have it here. But I'm, I'm the, the trial period is kind of messing up with me. Sorry, Wes, can you help me out here? <laughs> no, hold on, let me. I'll okay, well, I'm just trying to. What I'm trying to do is recognize some of the situations we're in. I don't want I don't want to have this debated and defeated because of the situation we're in. I want to see if there's some way we can recognize that we're moving into a recovery task force, that we've got uh, some financial challenges that we don't know the full impact of, depending on when this happens. So I'm just wondering 
I think Mr. Lake has a solution for us. Okay. So if we start the motion with upon repayment of fee for service of transit, that kind of acknowledges that we're not charging for transit at all right now. Is that kind of what you're looking for? That that's that helps definitely, but the trial period of one year. So you would start that trial period of one year when uh, the resumption of service of fee for service. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. you would try that then. Okay. All right. Um, I guess to ledge that's just be changed to Tony's wording right at the beginning. So upon oh, there it is. There it is. Sorry, I didn't have my chat open. Sorry. That the free all aboard program and just continues with the rest of the motion. If that makes sense. Okay, we'll get it. We'll get it all. I have it here. Okay. Um, I'm going to go to oh. Council Broadhead. Did you have a question? Oh. Oh. You were probably trying to point me to the chat. I apologize. Okay. Uh, Councillor Hansen? Not now, because uh, that's exactly what I was looking for. Okay, so can you read the motion exactly how you want it, Councillor Jolly? You're muted, yep. Right. Upon reinstatement of fee for service of, sorry, a fee for service of transit, that the free all aboard program for low income residents be extended to local handy bus service for a trial period of one year. At the end of the one year period, the trial should be assessed based on items such as cost to the municipality, ridership numbers, etc. Furthermore, that up to $30,870 be funded from the stabilization fund to support this initiative. All right, I'm seeing no more questions. So I'm going to accept your motion and let you start with your debate. Thank you. You know, the, I'll be really brief for this one. Um, you know, our our diversity and inclusion declaration, it, it says explicitly that, that we embrace diversity and we're proud to be an inclusive and accessible place of people and that we will work hard so that all residents and, and visitors are valued and included. So support for this motion is support, is, is support for aligning our all aboard program for low income residents with the idea that residents who require handy bus service are um, or should have equal access to this particular program and they shouldn't be at a disadvantage because they're not able to use our regular um, transit service. Right. Thank you. Anyone else on debate? Wow, that's kind of quiet. Right. Well, I, I asked my question. I can give you the chance to close. If you I, have some oh, closing notes. I was expecting you guys to argue with me. <laughs> uh, I, I'm just going to point out that back in March, um, our community services department released their community let, newsletter, and it included a quote from the Canadian Association of the Advancement of Wo Women in Sport, talking about the difference between equality and equity. Um, it, it said that equality focuses on creating the same starting line for everyone, and equity has the goal of providing everyone with the full range of opportunities and be benefits, the same finish line. So that's what we're doing here, allowing our handy bus users to access the full range of opportunities and benefits, the same finish line as our regular transit us users. So this is really just a continuation of our commitment to diversity and inclusion. That's all. All right. Well said. Uh, call for the vote. All those in favor? Hanson, Hughes, Mackay, Watkins. It's unanimous. <laughs> okay. Any um, information requests, notice of motions or announcements? Councillor Broadhead. Just uh, an, an information request. Uh, when the opening of uh, Lions Park comes along, uh, are there uh, bylaws in effect in other communities that would say, bring your own hibachi or bring your own self-contained uh, barbecue rather than have uh, open fires burning wood? I, it doesn't bother me, but it does bother some when the burning of wood happens and, and asthma is contracted. So I'm just asking, if we could do a brief lit review as to whether or not there's uh, such a bylaw in other uh, communities, just in the in, in like-sized municipalities in Alberta, just to narrow the focus. 
Yep, for sure. Thank you. Councilor Hughes. Thank you. This occurred to me this week. So um, part of our revenue recovery is getting um, one day people will ride the bus again in more greater numbers and we get more revenue recovery from that. But whenever I see any of the phasing in, there's always with restrictions, both to protect the employees and then the people who are using the service. So what I was wondering, and you may not have an answer now, but you, at some point, is I know we aren't putting the plexiglasses in the buses, but if they say we can open up more or something of that nature, like if right now we have everybody doing rear entry, but if you were to start paying for it, you'd have to go in the front. And if we don't have any of the protective of gear to protect both the people getting on as well as the drivers from the people getting on, would that be a hindrance for us to be able to start collecting fares? Because like right now we have a system that's free, but it, eventually we won't, hopefully. Uh, yeah, I'd have to get back with specific uh, information, but you know, I, I believe we were charging a fare when we were even at the 50% capacity prior to going to the free fee. So, you know, as we ramp down in service there, there'll probably be a ramp up as well, so. I'm just, cause I'm just thinking like all these businesses have to put up plexiglass and all these extra precautionaries. And I'm just not sure if that may be one of the requirements. I'm just thinking we may wanna to talk to the province to see what they might expect some of the restrictions to be as relates to, um, you know, making sure that we, we aren't, because I'm just thinking, for example, if, if they said there had to be some kind of a barrier between the um, people riding and the driver and we don't have that together, then we could be delaying when we could actually uh, start charging for fares because we wouldn't be able to do front entry. So I'm just suggesting that that may be something we may want to think about because we may have to do something more than what we're currently doing when we start doing front, front loading. We'll, we'll look into it. Okay. Any more information requests? Okay, seeing none. All right. Um, let's make a motion to go into camera, Councillor Mackay. And then uh, once we're voted on that, I'll give you guys 10 minutes or so. Um, so go ahead, Councillor Mackay. Uh, is this the one with uh, off, uh, CAO dialogue? Yes, there it is. Uh, that council move in camera to have a confidential dialogue with the chief administration officer pursuant to section 24.1a of the Freedom of Information and Privacy Act. All right, accept that motion. Call for the vote. That's unanimous. I have 6.57, so 7.10, real quick. And uh, Mr. Mr. Scoble, um, Councillor Hansen might not be sticking around for all of it. So when we first get into the in camera, can you kind of go through the list of things you have? Okay. And, um, she can maybe ask you to move some to the top so she's gonna run off and do some other things. Okay. okay. Great. 